St. Louis, a beautiful city on the Mississippi, in the Mississippi River Valley. Why do we call this an old world capital? Well, even the mainstream admits that there was something here, and there's been something here for many hundreds of years, or perhaps more. Of course, we have no idea. And the mainstream calls it the Cahokia culture, supposedly a group of Native Americans that lived on the east side of the Mississippi River, and once had a great and flourishing civilization, and now we call them Mound Builders. Frequent viewers of this channel might remember an early exploration that was done in Wisconsin, near the town of Lake Mills, where we discussed some mounds there, and how they were called mounds, although they were very clearly pyramids, but we don't call them pyramids. We have the typical founding story with St. Louis, and St. Louis was founded on February 14, 1764, by some French fur traders. Three individuals, isn't it funny how it's always three or four? And from that time on, the area and the city and the settlement slowly grew. We have the Lewis and Clark expedition going through there. We have the fact that it was part of the Louisiana Purchase and that it was sold to the United States. And then because of its central position on the river, it developed into an incredible city. And yet when we look into the detail of this city, we see a plethora of incredible structures and a very rich history that once again defy simple explanation. The purpose of today's exploration is to look at some of the most profound of these structures and pose the typical questions that we have on this channel about their origin and does it truly point to an old world civilization or are these structures that our current civilization did. And of course, St. Louis has so many different aspects and so many of these structures, there's no way we're going to be able to cover them on one video. So these are just the initial structures that we're going to take a look at. No doubt the channel will be returning to St. Louis to explore other aspects of it, as there's no way we could cover it in a single video. So let's begin. We start with looking at Eads Bridge, which fortuitously was completed in construction in 1874, the same year as this rendering or this aerial drawing or whatever you want to call it was completed. The other interesting thing about St. Louis is just how well built out it is in 1874. Here's a picture of one of the mounds or the remnants of it and who knows what this structure really was. We'll be told that this was something from some pre-existing Native American civilization that was there, although when you look at it you have to wonder. We'll do a separate exploration on the mounds because they require that kind of level of detail to theorize and speculate what was really going on in St. Louis. It's an incredible structure in and of itself, and it almost looks like it could be the cornerstone of some much larger structure. And we go to the Cahokia Mound in East St. Louis, or I believe it's Collinsville, the town in Illinois where it's located near. And we recall the exploration that we did to mounds and pyramids in Wisconsin, and here we have the same thing, supposedly from the same civilization. It's a mound. It's not a pyramid. It just looks like a pyramid. You can never get enough of that one. Very beautiful, and it paints the picture that there was definitely a pre-existing civilization in St. Louis. In 1849, St. Louis experienced a fire, because every city experienced some fire at some point. The story of the fire in St. Louis is quite fascinating, though, because it stated that it was started by a paddle steamer, or a boat that somehow caught fire, nobody knows how, and it caught other boats on fire, and then somehow those boats caught the buildings on fire, destroying hundreds of buildings. And here is a photo, or an early version of a photo, from 1849, and the destruction that was reaped by that fire. Hmm. Do you really think that a fire could cause this kind of destruction? Well, maybe you do and let me know in the comments how and why you think such destruction would be possible. It's also staggering when you look at the type of construction in these buildings in 1849, and then in the distance you see the buildings that seem to survive the fire, or whatever force really caused this destruction. Yes, I question if it was a fire, because that's always the explanation that's given. Just an incredible tower back there, and then you see some of the buildings. 1849 in St. Louis. It's very revealing in and of itself when you look at photos like these with this kind of destruction. Of course, it wasn't just a fire that hit St. Louis, much like Louisville, which shares its namesake as they were both named after King Louis. St. Louis was hit by a tornado, a cyclone, although I think they call it a tornado, in 1896. So we have a fire 
and a tornado for St. Louis. And of course, this is a very devastating tornado because what else would it be? And we have numerous photos of the destruction from the 1890s. Look at the road and the rails there. Another recurring theme that we see. What came first? The bricks in the road or the rail? Who really knows? Again, just a staggering amount of destruction, which is always in the origin stories of these cities. This was an intriguing photo because we're given that this photo is from an early period in St. Louis, 1840s, 1850s, and we're told that these individuals are involved in the slave trade at the time. Although it looks like it's just a group of people who are just hanging out and they could frankly be doing anything, talking about how they're going to set up St. Louis for future generations to consider it. Who knows? In any event, here's another photo from the 1880s, and we see the well-built-out city. We see all the detail in the construction. And here we see it looks like mud is covering the road, but you still have tracks, and there's even a trolley. Can't tell if it's being pulled by a horse or not. Later photo from the 1890s, although to be fair, these photos could be from any time. We don't know for sure, but this is what we're told. And here we see more of the bricks and the tracks, and of course, very well built out already with some taller buildings, multiple stories. That's always the intriguing story about St. Louis is the fact that there's conflicting accounts. Here we have the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis completed in 1914, another gorgeous Catholic church. We saw many gorgeous churches in Louisville and now in St. Louis. Funny we don't call it St. Louis, although some people do. We have this same incredible architecture in 1914. And of course with the beautiful window, and as some of my frequent viewers will say, their favorite word with a C. And if you know what that word is, go ahead and type it in the comments. This also gives an idea of life in St. Louis in the 1890s, and it's a different depiction than what we'd expect to see. It looks very luxurious and very comfortable. And little did they know that in two years the city was going to be hit by a very devastating tornado. However, I always find pictures like these showing just the regular life to be interesting as well because supposedly it gives you some sort of insight to what's really going on and how the people were living their life at the time. I like the gentleman in the front there who's looking back towards the camera. And this is the Wainwright Building, an early skyscraper that was built in the 1890s in St. Louis that stands today. Very beautiful building with a lot of ornate and intricate detail on it. And it's incredible that it survives to this day because usually these are the buildings that would be the first targets of the so-called urban renewal of the 1960s in the United States. So there's our intro to St. Louis. Let's take a look at some fine details and structures. Let's begin with the old courthouse in St. Louis. The old courthouse. Originally the land was designated for it in 1816. And then we have one of these recurring stories where they spent years building it, rebuilding it, remodeling it, tearing down a wing, rebuilding a wing. And then by 1864 they had finished by establishing an amazing dome that was modeled after the Basilica in St. Peter's in Rome, much as the U.S. Capitol was. And that's how they explain the Capitol Dome looking like the U.S. Capitol Dome. It's a great story. We have to wonder if when they were settling Missouri and St. Louis, if this building was potentially considered to be the state capital. As wouldn't it make more sense for the state capital to be in St. Louis? No, go to Jefferson, they've got more steps and more columns on the state capital building there. Regardless, this courthouse is gorgeous on the inside. You see the columns lining the interior of this quote-unquote courtroom, which could just as easily be any other kind of room if it was properly configured to be, whether it was a state assembly hall or something along those lines. And look at the detail in the ceiling. I'm also amazed by how new and even modern, I dare say, this building looks on the inside. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's known for where they heard the Dred Scott decision, and that was a landmark Supreme Court case that was considered the powder keg for the United States Civil War. Looking at this building, you see a prototype for all U.S. capitals, potentially. And yet, its ornate detail and beauty matches every single one of them. Yet... This is not a capital, it's just a courthouse. And then looking on the inside in the dome and you see the same kind of detail and beauty, you see the pillars with the beautiful ornate detail on them. It defies simple explanation. And we have to wonder what's really going on here when we see a structure like this that's designated a courthouse and yet it resembles a state capital and exceeds the modern state capitals of many states, in my humble opinion of course. What do you think? 
The Anheuser-Busch Brewery, considered a brewery complex, opened in 1852. Yes, of course, you need a very large complex with a huge clock tower and large smokestacks and many buildings if you're going to properly brew beer. We don't have much in the history behind how this complex was constructed, and it still stands today in all of its excessive number of buildings and yet details with these buildings, seeing some of the foundation construction stones. I think they're being the most honest when they tell us that this was opened in 1852. They don't really say anything about construction and they don't use the typical word of founding. It was just opened, almost as though they found the facility as it was, occupied it, and decided to start brewing beer. They must have been brewing a lot of beer when you see the amount of infrastructure, the detail, and the simple space that goes into this brewery complex. I suppose calling it a brewery complex is again another honest aspect. And here it is today. You can still see this today, and it should be telling the fact that this brewery complex endures to this day, complete with the smokestacks, the clock tower, and all the amazing beautiful detail. Do you think we could build a brewery complex like this today? The St. Louis City Hall. They started construction on this in 1890, and they say they finished in 1904, 14 years to build this elaborate beauty. Of course, we'll be told it's some sort of French Renaissance revival style, but I think I'm going to call this one steampunk revival style. Now, what do you think? What would be a good name for a structure like this? Look at the baseline stones and the small columns there towards the bottom. Then you have something different as you go up above the first floor. It's an incredible mixture of different styles, supposedly. Although we wonder who really built it. I'm having trouble accepting the narrative on this one. Look at the portal windows there. And then all the elaborate detail along the exterior. Each of the three doorways, and it looks to be sectional pillars along each doorway. Although who knows for sure. I'm just going off of appearances. It's been a while since I've been to St. Louis, and when I was around the City Hall, I remember just being struck by its beauty. And you even see the clock up there, the detailed ornate clock. The coloring is also interesting with what the construction actually is. We'll be told it's sandstone, limestone, a mix of concrete, and all the other elaborate exotic materials that seem to be available. But then we look in the interior, and we see something just quite otherworldly. Again, this looks like the interior of some sort of building that could be used for a science fiction or a fantasy setting. And I go back to steampunk revival style because I'm thinking of that when I look at the interior of this unbelievable city hall. Now, we've seen the other ones and what makes them unbelievable, but for here it's the styling. And you just have to wonder how exactly they pulled this off from 1890. 1890 to 1904 as they told us windows arches skylights similar to what we've seen in other buildings and state capitals and here it is in the st louis city hall but i think there's even more detail if we look harder that we can see in both the inside and outside of this extraordinary building and we look on the outside and we see the interesting structure and some of the adornments on the towers that don't really make a lot of sense and you have to wonder what was the point behind this and it also makes it difficult to really calculate or estimate what the age could be there are so many conflicting estimates you can get just by looking at this building and of course we're always told they need to clean it but then you see a contrast here in this black and white photo and again, we see the scaling with these columns, and we wonder how these were emplaced, and what kind of efforts went to achieve this, whoever originally built this building. I mean, if it was just our contractors and our genius architect in 1890, we have to wonder what challenges they had to overcome. But of course, it's hard to accept the narrative with a building like this, when you see this kind of beauty. This is definitely an extraordinary city hall building that matches what we've seen so far. If not in size, then at least in beauty and artistic, inspirational appeal. 
Definitely something that's not easily forgotten when it comes to considering the history of St. Louis and the true history of these cities. And now to the Eads Bridge. They started construction on this in 1867 and completed it in 1874. Designed and architected, you know how that goes, by James Buchanan Eads, another inventor, civil engineer, extraordinaire from the 19th century. And here we have the drawing or rendering of it, and this connects St. Louis to East St. Louis across the mighty Mississippi River. Incredible that it only took them seven years to construct this. We have some nice drawings of the construction here on this original drawing that no doubt convinces us and others that would look at this that this bridge really was built as they said that it was within seven years. The interesting thing about James Buchanan Eads is that he had quite the reputation for being able to conceptualize solutions to very difficult problems. And it didn't matter what kind of engineering problems that they encountered. He seemed to always have a solution. Just like many of these other incredible architects that we encounter when we look at the official historical narrative behind these structures. It's a beautiful bridge and it clearly took a lot of effort and it only took them seven years. But I wonder, do we have any photos? Well, I came across this construction photo, and yet there are certain things within the detail of it that causes questions. For example, we see that the support pylons seem to already be complete, and we have to wonder, are they just reconnecting the support pylons? Or is there something a little bit more off in this uh, particular picture of the construction of the Eads Bridge? Because, of course, we have the typical vanilla skies, and then so much missing detail when we look towards the top of it. What does this really tell us? Or is this not telling us something? What's even more strange is that when you look at the right of the supports, it almost looks as though the stone in construction seems new, but then towards the base, it looks like it's old. So I don't know, what do you think about this photo? Let me know in the comments. And then look at this over here. Some of these stones just look very old, the foundation stones, or that they've been subjected to some kind of force. Was there some other fire? Were there other steamboats just randomly catching on fire in the Mississippi? should be noted that James Buchanan Eads also constructed and designed the Union River ironclads that were decisive, supposedly, for the Union securing control of the Mississippi River during the Civil War. In the United States Civil War, it stated that in the Western Theater, the Union or the North had essentially won the war by 1863. And now on to the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. This has been covered extensively by many explorers over time, and I haven't really touched the World's Fairs in detail yet, but it is worth noting that a very significant World's Fair occurred in St. Louis, and this was considered the next biggest one after Chicago. And we've seen many of these photos before with these beautiful, impressive, and yet temporary buildings. Although what I find fascinating is that the construction cues that we see on them match many of the construction cues that we see on the state capitals. We see the rotunda, the portal windows, the pillars, the columns, and it seems to show itself in a lot of these buildings. What's the true story here? Were these temporary buildings as we're told? Or were these older existing buildings that were simply showcased in an exposition, a World's Fair, and then afterwards, they were quickly demolished, along with the story that they were always temporary. I'm not sure. It's interesting, though, how what was original research on the World's Fairs has suddenly become very clouded over the last couple of years. We initially just had photos such as this that gave us the indication that these were all real structures, and there really wasn't much question about it. And when I say real structures, appearing as though that they were structures that had always been there and were far older than one would think as temporary structures? Well, it's a question we continue to struggle to answer. Moving on to Union Station in St. Louis, the beautiful, opulent, and very massive Union Station. They tell us they opened this beauty just like the brewery in 1894, no real timeline for construction. Huge building, and we see the amazing clock tower, and after some of the comments, I'm not wondering now if that tower was potentially a docking port for airships, or if that was the intention. Why do you need a clock tower that tall on what's supposed to be a rail station? This was the largest rail station in the world when it was constructed, and you have to really see some of these photos to get an idea for 
the immense area. And I remember doing a joint exploration with Old World Exploration on this. And even though I'd actually been to this location, I didn't fully appreciate the size and immensity behind it. Just how large the covered area running to the station itself was where they had the train stage. Also a little note for film buffs out there, the famous scene in Escape from New York in 1981 where Snake Plissken rescues the president from the train he's being held in was filmed in this very same location, right here in this covered area where all the trains were staged. And if you watch a more HD version of the film, you can see it very clearly and it gives you a good idea of the size and immensity of not just the structure, but the sheltered area for all the trains. And we have to wonder, when they say opened, it really just gives the feeling, much like founded, that they just came across the building, occupied it, and then put it back into service. And we do have to wonder if there were other functions for this incredibly large building, especially with the very tall tower, and just the amount of space that you have. Although, looking at this entryway, and the beauty in the stones, and the detail in the arch, I remember seeing this when I was a kid, and I was in awe of it, but I didn't understand then exactly what this meant. And when you look at the exterior stones, and yet the detail and the precision and how they're cut, it's something that defies simple explanation. And not even saying anything for the sidewalk or the walkway that runs right up to this incredible entrance. And we haven't even talked about the interior yet. And here we have our classic, beautiful interior, something that exceeds everything that we've seen with Art Deco, and certainly there's nothing modern or contemporary that's been built that matches the interior of this. And this is really where you get an idea of something that's completely and totally otherworldly. Just in case you were feeling a little lonely on water towers, let's look at the Compton Hill Water Tower in St. Louis. A beautiful standpipe water tower, as they called it. This was built in 1898. Apparently it only took them a year. Again, we see this incredible beauty and detail with what looks to be sort of a bell top construction. And then a couple subsidiary towers, including a subsidiary tower that's actually taller than the main tower, it appears. Very beautiful. One has to wonder why. And here's our construction photo, supposedly, of the standpipe number three, as they called it in the photo, although it did become the Compton Hill Water Tower. Yes, isn't that a very beautiful and convincing construction photo? I really like how pristine those blocks look, too. Although, where would one see pristine blocks in the completed water tower? I have to wonder. And if they really did use standpipe water towers, well, why did they ever go away from them? They seem to be beautiful and they worked well, although allegedly this one was retired after 30 years. And now the next standpipe water tower in St. Louis, because there's more than one. This is the Bissell Street Water Tower, and this is 206 feet tall. The Compton Water Tower we just looked at before was 179 feet tall. Again, another very beautiful standpipe water tower, and we're told this one was built in 1886. And now we come to the piece of resistance of water towers in St. Louis, the third standpipe water tower. The Grand Avenue Water Tower, and at 154 feet, it is the tallest freestanding Corinthian column in the world. Yes, we had to build a freestanding Corinthian column, the tallest in the world, around a water tower. Don't you find this interesting? One has to wonder why this is the situation. And if you look at the layout of the neighborhoods around these water towers, they're very interesting as well, and definitely warrant more detailed exploration. A giant, freestanding, Corinthian column. Now on to the Civil Courts Building, our patented Art Deco building for the city. Yes, the Civil Courts Building, built in 1930. Interestingly enough, as though it wasn't impressive that they were trying to compete with the old courthouse, which, as we said earlier, looks like a state capitol, this one they decided to model the top after the mausoleum at Heliconarsis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And why not? Why wouldn't you do this in 1930, right after the Great Depression hit? You need to make sure that you have the most beautiful, ornate, and opulent top to your building, that's a civil court building no less, that there is nothing in the world that can compete with it. And apparently, cost is no object. 
You can do this and you can pull it off. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world and they put it on top of a building in St. Louis. And this is very beautiful and it's ornate and it's detailed and we have to wonder how they did it. And I was very curious when I saw this so I searched feverishly for construction photos of this incredible building. In my search I found the photos of the statues on the top of it. Yes, nothing says American democracy or courts as these statues do. It's also interesting how old they appear already, although this is a more modern picture because we can see the modern and very un-old world arch in the background. Look at the symbolism on these figures. Tell me in the comments what this reminds you of. And what's the symbol that seems to be on the chest of one of these figures? What do they really represent? And how would this have been something that was put up there during the Art Deco period? Something that defies simple explanation. And it is very intriguing that these statues do happen to rest right in the middle of the arch. Almost as though the arch was built simply to decorate the statues in a photo. Well, here's the construction photo I came across. And yes, you have your girders and your very questionable construction photo. Maybe it was a foggy or dusty day when they took it. You'd think they'd have some construction photos from the ground looking up or something like that, but, you know, it was in the late 1920s, and maybe they just didn't have the capability to do that yet. Ah, oh, I enjoy this one. Now, why would they have three individuals putting the top on the column here? And look at the foot there on that gentleman in the front. Do you think he's really holding on securely to that scaffolding with his foot? You know, one wrong step, and the next thing you know, your workforce is doing a wily e. coyote all the way to the ground at terminal velocity. Well, I guess it was either work or die, you know, put yourself at extreme risk or you would starve because obviously there was no labor available on the farms, only children could do that. This is another one of those inexplicable photos, but by all means, let me know what you think in the comments. Why exactly did they have to line up the top of this column in that manner? Okay, enough of that. Let's uh, take a look at some schools here to close out St. Louis. And here we have uh, the towers of Robert S. Brookings Hall in Washington University, St. Louis. It's not a castle, is it? It just looks like a castle. Or is it a bunch of towers? But, you know, as someone told me on Reddit, a uh, castle can really be anything. And, of course, you see the archway here and the ornate detail around the windows. I'm reminded of uh, one of the schools I looked at uh, in Duluth, although if memory serves, that was a college, or at least that's what they said it was. And, you know, I, I guess it's just how we have to build out our colleges. Interesting with the stones around the doorway. And then look at how beautiful and detailed those figures are right there. For a high school. And here, a college. And we've seen both. And again, what's with the point of the parapets? You know, in case the students decide to go up there and reenact some action scenes from their favorite medieval novels. You know, get a little broken window there. But it still looks very beautiful. Why would this kind of effort be put into just a school? This is Summer High School. Summer High School. Very old photo. And we see some of the familiar construction cues that we've come across in other locations. The little tower the Piedmont, or the little triangular uh, Roman Forum looking device, and of course columns and pillars, along with a lot of chimneys. You have to wonder what the original intention of this building was, because once again, this is something that defies simple explanation. And to close out, I just wanted to include this photo. Supposedly this is repaving a street in St. Louis. And I've never actually seen a photo like this where it looks like they're playing Jenga with replacing the individual blocks in the road. And is this all the larger their crew is? I mean, it looks like we have maybe six, seven individuals down at the end, a couple people gawking and watching, and then these three just standing there. Look, it's a bunch of blocks on the road. Yep. Well, do you know where they go? I'll just... uh keep standing and looking and maybe the blocks will go where they're supposed to go. What do you think of this photo? Let me know in the comments. Now I know that in this exploration of St. Louis there are many more things that we can take a look at and we will. There's museums, there's other beautiful ornate old world buildings in St. Louis. It is full of them. These are just some of the ones that really stood out and this is really just an introduction to the beautiful city of St. Louis many of which still stands today, and it's a wonderful place to visit where you can see this. Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe. 
Thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel. And today we're going to be returning to St. Louis, Rome of the West, for an on-site exploration. And you're probably asking why are we returning to St. Louis, and one of the individuals I'd spoken to on the ground in St. Louis informed me that it was called Rome of the West. And I asked why, and this person told me, well, it's because of the Catholic diocese and all the Catholic individuals who resided in St. Louis. But I suspected there may be another reason, and we're going to explore that today. Our exploration is going to take us to the Grand Avenue Water Tower and the Bissell Street Water Tower. We're going to be examining them close and in person to see how large they actually are. We're also going to be looking at Eads Bridge and examining that, along with the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis. Then there's several locations in the downtown that we're going to be taking a look at, along with Union Station and the Court Appeals or the U.S. Appeals Court that we looked at in the previous exploration. What I suspect is that a lot of the architecture in St. Louis resembles what we would think of as Greco-Roman architecture. Now we come across this in old world explorations before, but we're really going to be examining this to see if this is the real reason why St. Louis is called Rome of the West. As I suspect that was merely a statement story, if you will, about the vast number of Catholics in St. Louis. We'll always be told something along those lines that there's some other explanation for it. When we look at the downtown, though, we see the U.S. Appeals Court building and several other beautiful Art Deco buildings. We also have the St. Louis City Hall that we're going to be examining and Stiffel Theater right along there. And there's Union Station. So when we look at these locations, we're going to be examining them in person and up close to see exactly how large they truly are and what sort of construction they have. We'll be moving over to Compton Hill where we'll look at the other standing stovepipe water tower or standpipe water tower and there's also some very interesting houses located along the street in the Compton Hill area and I want to make sure that we examine some of the residential areas as well because some people say that well if you just have one isolated building it doesn't necessarily prove or indicate anything and that may be true but when you have several residences around a certain particular area that appear like old world buildings, or let's just say you have an entire neighborhood of old world buildings, that may tell a slightly different story. And we'll be concluding the exploration by going back and taking a look at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, moving north and west from the Compton Hill area, and concluding with the Cathedral Basilica. Something that I must admit, I was quite surprised with how tremendously large this location truly was. So when we look at all these different edifices, we're going to consider exactly the construction techniques and we're also going to consider what kind of thought process went into their building if we go off of the mainstream account. And recall that the mainstream account of the city of St. Louis was that it was founded years past and yet when we look at images in several of the earlier bird's eye views we see that it's very well built out and what I learned being on the ground is that it is still well built out one of the aspects that you learn with St. Louis is how far to the west it actually goes from the river and we have another story of a fire in St. Louis in 1849 that was started by a ship that rammed into another ship and then somehow the buildings caught fire and I've been assured by some very, we'll just call them emphatic individuals in the comments, that this fire really did happen. I'm not sure how they could be so certain about it. I mean, we have pictures of essentially every city in the United States that show fire damage and destruction. And of course, we recall that St. Louis being referred to as the City of the Mounds. And someone else also took issue with that. But who knows exactly where these mounds really were. There's very little left of them. We also have our traditional images of St. Louis looking at it from the 1890s through the 19 or through the early 20th century and we have many questions in the images that we see. We're also told that it was struck by a tornado in the 1890s. So you have a fire, a tornado, the usual slew of disasters whether they were artificial or natural that gives you a lot of explanation. One thing we didn't look at though in this exploration is the Wainwright building. It's not that the Wainwright building is not particularly interesting, but what I wanted to focus on for this one is looking at all the Greco-Roman architecture. Now I didn't limit it to that, but I didn't get to the Wainwright building. So let's begin with the Grand Avenue Water Tower. The tallest freestanding Corinthian column in the world over 150 feet. 
And strangely enough, it's also within sight of the Bissell Street water tower. I find this very interesting because we're told that this beautiful water tower was built in 1871. Why did they need to build another one so close to it? And when you look at it in person, you're just completely taken aback by how large it really is and how tall it is. Imagine if this was an actual column that supported some large structure. And maybe that's originally what the Bissell Street water tower, which you can see in the background there, was a part of as well. Just an amazing large column. And yet in that same area, there was also an abandoned church that didn't appear to be any sort of a lacking building in any way, shape, or form. We can see we have the large window and very beautiful architecture and construction on this with the columns and the pillars. Yet this church is completely abandoned. And look at how beautiful it is. This neighborhood is very interesting because it appears to be suffering from neglect and yet you have all these very beautiful buildings. One thing you'll notice as we go on with this exploration in St. Louis is that everything is either made of masonry or stone. And it'll be one of the questions that I have for you at the end of the video because I'd like to get some feedback. There's also just these other buildings that are in the immediate area. Here we have the Good Hope Baptist Church and we have some nice beautiful columns on the front and all made of brick. And here's the original church that we were looking at that was abandoned, and it has this beautiful tower. And it has these wonderful figures on it, and you can see that no effort was spared in this architecture. And yet this is abandoned, this is neglected. Well now we move on to the Bissell Street Water Tower, and this one was built in 1886, or so we're told. And this is more incredible construction. As if the f tallest freestanding Corinthian column in the world wasn't enough, you walk two blocks over where for some reason they needed another water tower, and they built this beauty. And then you look at the houses in the residential area and you see that they're all constructed out of brick themselves and are all old world structures. So it's not just the water towers, it's an entire neighborhood made of brick and masonry. So make of that what you will. The foundation stones or blocks are just incredible. And it looks to be a combination of granite and limestone and some sort of very solid concrete. And I'm certainly not going to suggest that it's Portland cement. I have a feeling Portland cement would not hold up too well under these conditions. If we consider the fact that this tower is as old as they say it is. 1886 to 2023. And it's holding up this well and it is this beautiful. And it's quite an awe-inspiring sight. And many of the things that we're going to be taking a look at in this exploration are awe-inspiring. Such as the Eads Bridge, built from 1867 to 1874. Yes, that fine building time after the United States Civil War. And pointing out some of the blocks here, as someone told me, this is merely an architectural process called rustication. Yes, there's always some architectural process to explain why the blocks protrude or why they age the way they did, because in one of the original images of the Eads Bridge, it already looked old. Well, of course, it still looks old now, but it's closing on 150 years old. Look at some of the archways though, and then it's mixed with the bricks there. What I find most amazing though is that this bridge is still standing and has had limited renovation work on it for over 149 years. And why do we have different coloring there? Is that from some subsequent fire or is that just some other architectural process that causes selective aging on some of these blocks or maybe they look a little older? That's the Eads Bridge and it's a very awe-inspiring sight and the fact that it's still standing and still functional to this day with vehicles, trains, and pedestrian traffic going over it, yes, that's not questionable at all. I have a question though, could we build a bridge today that would last 150 years and that would be doing this well with our modern construction processes? Maybe we could, but I still find it very impressive that at that time we could build a bridge. And then look at this, all these beautiful buildings in the downtown of St. Louis with different construction techniques from bottom to top with the base stones. And finally, we reach the old courthouse, the one that was built in the 1820s and then added to, the one that appears quite a bit like a state capitol. Unfortunately, I couldn't access the inside of it because once again, they were doing renovations, so make of it what you will. But I was able to get some great exterior footage of it, and you can see what a beautiful building it is with the pediments and the columns, and of course, the beautiful dome. This seemed to be something that was a little advanced for its time because, as you recall, looking at dome architectural prints in the United States from the early 19th century, they had a different style, such as what we saw at the U.S. Capitol. And yet, this completely defies that. This defies that timeline. And even close to the courthouse, you'll find other buildings of beautiful architectural style. 
such as this particular building, which was only a block away, and you see the large columns and the interesting sphere at the top of it. And I verified that this is all real material, all hard masonry construction. Mississippi Valley Trust Company with the beautiful pillars incorporated in the wall. Very intriguing. Now continuing down the road from the old courthouse, you see the U.S. Appeals Court. That was the building that was very easily constructed in the late 1920s where we had that fun picture of the individual who was just hanging on by a foot as they were lifting one of the columns in place. Yes, I'm sure it was very easy to build that. And it also has what appears to be the mausoleum of Heliconarsis on the top with the two sphinx-like figures, which just happen to sit in between the arch. And no, I didn't look at the arch. I really wasn't feeling like looking at more modern architecture today. It was a rather hot day, and I figured the best way to spend it was to look at these old world structures. And finally, we reach the Union Station. And the Union Station is one of the buildings that I recall looking at uh, in a joint exploration with Old World Exploration, and that was quite enjoyable. And looking at it in person is no less awe-inspiring. Built in the 1890s with these very large blocks and this very beautiful architecture, and look at this large tower with the clock. It's quite awe-inspiring, though, to see it in person and to realize that this building is real and you can interface with it. From my perspective, it was not a picture, it was not a video. I could see it, I could walk up to it, and walk inside of it. And don't worry, we've got some footage from the inside of the Union Station in St. Louis. Just incredibly beautiful, and my mind kept spinning trying to figure out how exactly they would have moved all these large blocks in place. How they would have arranged them in the 1890s. Yes, it's on the railroad. It makes sense that they could have brought them in on the railroad. But they still would have had to arrange all these blocks and build these beautiful towers. And what was the purpose behind all this for what was just a train station? And yet when you examine a lot of this block work and this masonry up close and in person, you can see that it's holding up quite well. It looks very beautiful today and it's probably going to last another 1,000, 10,000 or 100,000 years. I mean, just look at the size of some of these blocks. And here I put out my hand for comparison for just how large this block truly is. So even if you brought it in on a train, how long would it have taken to put all these blocks in place? And it's very impressive the way they fit together. Going inside, though, the first thing you come across is what's called Whispering Arch. So naturally, the entryway has an arch in it, and what you can do is stand on opposite sides of the arch, and you can whisper, and the whisper will travel across the arch to the person standing on the other side, and they can hear exactly what you're saying. And I'd like to thank uh, Derek, the tour guide, door person, who informed me of this little fact as I walked in. And you'll see that inside the Union Station, you're just awed by unbelievable beauty. And you have columns and arches everywhere you look, and this beautiful window and this relief with this imagery in it. And that's the Whispering Arch right there, which seems to reflect some of the cymatics that we've encountered in other explorations. And this building, the Union Station in St. Louis, seems to reflect this capability. But when you look inside of this main gallery, this is just exceptional. These figures that you're looking at are not painted. They're actually relief figures, which I thought was utterly astounding. It's not just the size and immensity of the inside of the Union Station. It's the sheer level of detail and the effort that it had to take to construct all of this. So it's not just the fact that they built what we see as a castle or a chateau or whatever you want to call it, a palace on the outside. It's also all this detailed work that they went on the inside. And I came a little closer to the figures so that you could see that these are actual reliefs that they protrude from the wall. How difficult was this? We're told that it only took them three years to build this incredible building. Oh, and it does have a bathroom, and the bathroom seems to be adorned with gold. So make of that what you will. Finally, a building that was actually designed with a bathroom in mind. And you see this beautiful clock right here with the old-style Roman numerals on it. And yet, more arches, more decoration. And I did verify that all these materials were hard masonry. And it's as though you just couldn't get enough columns here in this building. And here's another view of the reliefs. Very beautiful. And what does this symbolize? What does this represent? Wondering on the potential original purpose of this incredible building. And I know many viewers have their own theories, and please share them in the comments, because I always enjoy reading them. And here, even verifying that what looks to be tile is some sort of marble, and here you have more of a granite, limestone, sandstone construction. Or some other material, we have no idea what it truly is. Of course, we'll be told by the experts that they know what it is, but that's something I'm questioning even now. 
I'm just astounded by how well this building that's over 130 years old, especially the materials, is holding up. And even on the train shelter side of it, if you will, they've modernized it a little bit and they're still taking good care of it. So that is somewhat pleasing to see, although it looks very different. At least they didn't let it uh, erode or rot away. This is in the hotel section and they have this lobby set up here with these very beautiful pillars. Now from my close investigation, these do seem to be painted wood, but even so, it's very beautiful and they've put a lot of effort into making this grand lobby of this hotel portion of it appear very beautiful and very welcoming. Certainly more so than what you'd get in the Holiday Inn Express, which is what we settle for hotel accommodations and luxury now. And I look at these framed images of the so-called plans of the building, although I'm kind of reminded of one of our earlier explorations when we posited if architects were really architects or were they just recorders. When I see schematics, drawings like this, I'm given the reminder of recorders. It feels as though someone was simply going over this building and going over this site, and they were merely recording what they saw. Could be wrong, but when you look at all the artistic impressions and you verify that this is all the real material, it gives you a completely different inspiration of going through the Grand Hall in Union Station in St. Louis. You realize that somebody put a lot of time and had an incredible amount of capability to construct something like that. When we go back down towards the downtown a little bit and here we look at the US Appeals Court building and we see the beautiful columns that were somehow lifted high, apparently somebody nearly slipping to do that. And it's also surrounded by Art Deco buildings and yet many other buildings here, the memorial that we have in St. Louis to the World War I veterans. And then I found this interesting building that I just happened to be standing in front of while I was taking that footage. And it appears as though this was some sort of Missouri Court of Appeals building, but it didn't look like it was in use right now. Didn't really look into it because I was more inspired by what I saw on the outside of the building with all the columns and seeing that this was yet another building that a lot of effort had been put into constructing. And I'm sure if I looked in the history of it, we'll be told that it was constructed in the 1930s. But verifying that all the blocks on it were hard and real. And finally, we come to the gorgeous City Hall in St. Louis, another 1890s wonder. And then, of course, the statue of our city founder. And then this was the court building that I was looking at. And then there's the theater to the right of it. All these buildings reflect the so-called Greco-Roman style, where you have columns and pillars and pediments and all the usual details that we see when we look at these structures. And this is in St. Louis. And now a close-up of the city hall. And we see the same thing, although it almost looks like it's more of a beautiful style. Very unique style with this particular city hall. And seeing pictures didn't quite do it justice because when you look at it, you get the feeling that you're seeing an amalgamation of different building styles and capabilities. And I wonder if there was a different kind of clock that was originally on display there. And just looking at these archways and how they assembled all these stones. And then you see some of the columns and the pillars. This is just a very unique building and there's something about it that just defies imagination that you're looking at a building from a different time or a different time stream if you will. And you look at these beautiful arches with these very large shorter columns on the inside on the entryway. Just defies the abilities of words to describe. But then you look at another building and you see yet more columns and you see more of those construction techniques and then of course looking back at the original US Court of Appeals and you can see the two sphinxes on top of it and all the columns that were so easy for them to lift up in place when they built that building. Well, Now I moved over to take a look at uh, Stifle Theater or Stifle Theater as I called it because the uh, individual in the front was not very accommodating about letting me look around on the inside unless I bought a ticket which is fine but I find it interesting that this building, which was supposedly built in the early 1930s, has a couple bears out in front of it. And then they went to the effort of inscribing this on the side of the wall, where they broke up the word government. Democratic government. And look, they say democratic. They don't say constitutional republic. So once again, even in the 1930s, that's what we were selling to the people of the United States. And I have no doubt that we were the ones who inscribed those words in such a sloppy way on the side of that building, or at least the civilization that we're a part of. But yet you see these beautiful bear figures out in front and verified that they were material. 
that was real. Oh, here we go, Woodrow Wilson. And here we have more broken up words. Very interesting. Ka, mun, consul, yeah, council, consul. But looking at the beautiful columns and all the materials that went into this, I have great difficulty believing that that was built at the time. Anywhere you drive in St. Louis, you'll see the same thing. Beautiful buildings made out of brick. How many bricks are there total in St. Louis? And then, of course, the foundation stones that you see on nearly every single house. Whether it's a school, an administration building, there is no shortage of what you're looking for. And they called this a library museum, although the front portion of it's standing with the pediment in the columns, but it looks like it's collapsing in the back. Every single house that I looked at, though, was made of brick and foundation stones. And now we move to the Compton Hill Water Tower. The Compton Hill Water Tower, constructed in 1898 in the Compton Hill area of St. Louis. A little different than the first area that we looked at, although we'll see many of the same structures. And looking at this water tower more closely, another one of these so-called standpipe water towers, although you may as well call them stovepipe water tower, because what's the difference? You see the same details in construction, beautiful foundation stones, whether they're granite or what have you. And then looking around in the neighborhood, you see that many of these houses and buildings are constructed in a similar fashion. Just nothing but old world buildings everywhere you look. Whether it's a house or a larger building, you see amazing brickwork, elaborate emblems, elaborate motifs along them. And then you look back and you see that this is in the Compton Hill area with the water tower in the background. Also looking at the entryway to this neighborhood, and it looks like we have what appear to be either a couple of Griffiths or something else, I'm not sure. And then looking at this building with the reliefs on the front of it, Hutchison Arms, and look at the beautiful patterns in the brickwork on this building. And this is all in the same immediate vicinity. And look at the top. It's as though they just had all the time in the world and they were able to construct not just a water tower, but all these buildings. So I decided to take a look at some of the residential house or some of the houses or the residential area of the Compton Hill area. And the houses are incredible in and of themselves. They all have the large base foundation stones and they all have the very elaborate brickwork. And you'll even see that some of the entryways have elaborate decorations on them. Now this is not just one single millionaire's house, although I did stop by to take a look at what was supposedly the Happy Chef's Mansion, as it was called, and there's a little bit of a history with that, but it's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Yet it's just another elaborate house in a series of elaborate houses that make up this entire neighborhood. So how exactly do you explain this? Typically we'll be told that, well, somebody had a lot of money and that's how they were able to build one or two of these beautiful houses or castles or whatever you want to call them. And yet here in this Compton Hill area of St. Louis, you see nothing but houses that are constructed in this manner. Beautiful houses that are made of brick and have beautiful foundation stones and have all the details that we've come to expect in old world buildings. And it's as though I just couldn't stop spinning around and looking at it enough to really reinforce the point. But I thought a better way that I could do that instead of just trying to get closer to this one mansion, would be to simply drive down the road and give you an idea of what it truly looks like from the vehicle. And so I just leaned out the side of the window and I want you to look at every single one of these houses and see that they all have old world architecture in every single one, all with the large foundation, foundation stones and all made with brick. Now, how exactly do you explain that so many residences could have been constructed in this way? Was everybody just flowing with money? And by the way, the other neighborhood that we were in with the other water towers, you saw many of the same construction details. Well, look at the nice tower on that house, little fairy tale. And yet you'll see it when you look that some have the large foundation stones, other have others have elaborate brickwork, beautiful arches. It just goes on and on and on. And it eventually reaches a point where it just starts to get absurd because it, you can't walk anywhere in this part of St. Louis without running into an old world building. Quite frankly, I thought I could spend the rest of my life walking around this town. And I know someone will tell me in the comments, as they've had on many other videos, well, they just simply had more money. People worked harder. Okay, so everybody had more money. Everybody worked harder. How many bricks are just in all these houses alone? How did they produce all these bricks? And I know other explorers have talked about the fact that it's very difficult to locate the brick manufacturing facilities of the 19th century. You'll find simple concrete pads 
as the only remnants of it. And yet, as you drive down this entire road that runs all the way back to the Compton Hill water tower, that's all you see is old world buildings with bricks, with large foundation stones, and all the details of very elaborate construction that we've recognized in the old world. Quite frankly, it is absurd. And it's absurd to think that if you go with the mainstream account, you just simply believe it. And even driving down back into St. Louis itself, heading to the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, you'll see that there are other amazing, beautiful buildings everywhere you look, with beautiful patterns on them, beautiful motifs, and wonderful, incredible towers on them. As though there was just simply no shortage of time and materials and capability to go around. And yet, going through the entire city, that's exactly what you see. You see that there is nothing that comes beyond what your expectations are. And here, even just looking at this beautiful church, they jump out at you everywhere. And this is the route from Compton Hill heading to the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. You happen to see a couple other cathedrals on the way. And once again, just looking in any direction, oh, here we have the Scottish Rite Cathedral, because why not? You see nothing but columns, you see pillars, pediments, large foundation stones, yet more columns, every single building that you see in St. Louis. So I ask you, oh look, a pediment with columns on top of it there, because why not? Why wouldn't you just have so many columns and so many base stones? You, you just can't stop seeing it in St. Louis, and I was completely overwhelmed at all the detail and all the beauty that I saw. And I started to realize that referring to St. Louis as Rome of the West clearly had more to do with its appearance. Every single building also being unique in a way. It had the same details of construction, and yet you would see other individual aspects. How were they able to do this? Everybody was an artisan. Everybody was a craftsman. Everybody had the capability to make their own individual unique building. And even the smaller residences they still have the same details in them. And from my perspective, this is exactly why St. Louis is called Rome of the West. Because it looks like Rome of the West. In fact, I could argue that it looks more like Rome than Rome actually does. And closing in on the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, you see how it just comes out of nowhere, and you're completely taken back by how unbelievably large this Cathedral Basilica is. I'm surprised they didn't call it a Cathedral Basilica Temple Church or add more titles to it because quite frankly it warrants it. I had no idea how large this edifice was when I did the initial exploration but getting on the ground and taking a look at it you're just completely overwhelmed by how magnificent it is and how gargantuan it is and I could come up with many other adjectives to describe it but I'll simply let you see it in the imagery. And yet there's all the little detail in the construction, the small archways, the multiple archways, the little pediments, all the little details in a building that was built from 1907 to 1914, early 20th century. Yet good luck finding any construction photos of this incredible cathedral, basilica, temple. And honestly, I would accept the fact if they just would have told us that uh, it was divine intervention that established this very large building in St. Louis because it completely baffles simple explanation. And now looking at the front facade, we see our typical cymatic window with beautiful detail and a very unique pattern in it with multiple arches and very large towers. Now that's just the outside of the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. So I thought since I'd come all this way, it was only fitting I'd end the exploration by taking a look at the inside. And look at the beautiful cymatic window with the patterns on the front of it. And what would be the purpose behind that in 1907 to 1914? Here's the main entryway to this incredible building. And you can see that uh, it has all the beauty and detail that we'd come to expect to see in the early exploration that we had of Malta earlier in this week when we looked at some of the gorgeous churches there. And here's one of the side halls in the cathedral. And again, you can see the same thing. All this beautiful detail from the floor to the walls to the ceiling. And then going and taking a look at the actual altar and looking up in the domes. It is awe-inspiring. And as always, we have more columns because it's not as though we don't have enough columns that we've seen everywhere else. 
More columns, more arches, and a very beautiful dome from the inside. Decorated and detailed to match the finest cathedrals of Europe. And this is in the United States in St. Louis. This beautiful Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis, which matches any church in the world or any religious building or any building in the world with its beauty. And then I guess they decided to throw a little statue that looks like Laurel and Hardy or Jeeves and Wooster out front. So what do you think? Is St. Louis truly the Rome of the West after looking at this on-site exploration? What do you believe is the reality? Is the historical account still applicable to this city? Or is there some other account that we should be considering? What's the real story behind it? You consider all the beautiful edifices that we looked at, from the old courthouse to the cathedral basilica to the water towers, and I leave you with three questions. How many columns are there in St. Louis total? How many bricks total are there in St. Louis? Because let me assure you, nearly every single building in the interior St. Louis area and working your way out to the west, the northwest, and the southwest is made entirely of brick. And then how many neoclassical structures are there in St. Louis, or what we call the Greco-Roman buildings? Because, again, I assure you, there are far more than you might initially think. Doing this exploration on the ground was very eye-opening, and it showed me that there was much more to St. Louis than meets the eye. Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel and thank you for joining me for our exploration of Kansas City, Paris of the Old World Plains. The beautiful Kansas City, located at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers on the western side of Missouri. A little known fact that many people overlook is that Kansas City actually has a greater population than St. Louis. A very beautiful city that is quite worthy of the title Paris of the Old World Plains. And yet there are many mysteries behind Kansas City that we're going to explore. We see where Kansas City is located, right in the geographic center of the United States, and the geographic intersection of many great railroads. And this is quite a consideration when we think about what the capital city of a pre-existing civilization may have been. Now, recent explorations, which I even heard on John Levi's channel, indicate that perhaps Winnipeg was one of the major capitals of the North American continent. And there's no reason that can't be true. But considering some of the cities that exist in the United States, we have to consider the fact that Kansas City being at the major intersection point of so many existing railroads certainly lends to its potential prominence as one of the great cities of the pre-existing civilization. Now, could it be possible that Kansas City was built on a pre-existing civilization or it was a quote-unquote founded city? Absolutely. And was it also a city that existed in previous eras that we theorize on this channel with the eras that preceded the civilization before? Well, looking at what our contemporary historical account gives us, this is what Kansas City looked like in 1855. We have the usual story that the Native Americans roamed the lands, and then it was controlled by the French, and then briefly the Spanish, and then back to the French. Then it was acquired by the United States and the Louisiana Purchase, and Lewis and Clark came by during their little expedition to the Pacific, and they said, hmm, this looks like a good place to build a fort. Well, after that, Missouri became a state in the 1820s, and then they slowly built it up, and at the time it was simply known as the town of Kansas, until for some reason it became the city of Kansas, although who knows if that has anything to do with population. Interesting conflicting accounts. This is also the area where the Mormons had settled, and they view Jackson County as a very charmed and religiously important area. In any event, there was a conflict called the Mormon War in 1838. Although casualty figures from that war are very difficult to come by, we only know that there were 22 who died, and it says unknown civilian dead and wounded. So I guess it's not a very well-documented conflict. But just because something's not well-documented, at least we have an account that it happened. Yes, this is Father Donnelly, priest, mason, engineer, historian. 
He was from Ireland, but he was one of the, well, perhaps you could call him the first great citizen of Kansas City as he led efforts to pave the streets and clear out these incredible mounds and hills that overlooked the Missouri River on the north side of Kansas City. These photos are very interesting, and they're supposedly from 1860 to 1880, when Father Donnelly brought in many Irish workers to clear out this area. This is another interesting photo, supposedly from 1870, that shows a levee. Although, maybe somebody in the comments would like to point out to me where they actually see a levee in this photo. Very bizarre, and this is quite reminiscent of the photos that we saw when we looked at Seattle. So what's exactly the situation here? Did they just decide to plant this city in very difficult terrain and not locate it just slightly down the river? If you go a little ways east on the Missouri River, you've got some nice flat terrain. Who knows what the real situation was, but it gives the indication that there was something that was already existing there that they decided that they were going to work through, especially when you see photos like this. Now, are these photos real? Could they have been altered? Could there be some other story behind them? Absolutely. Regardless, though, they are as part of the official archives, and they do paint a very different picture of what was actually happening in Kansas City in the 19th century. As always, I leave it up to you. Perhaps you believe that it is well documented enough and that this story, even if it doesn't make sense logistically, is sensible and it holds up for how Kansas City got its start. I was completely unaware, though, that there was this massive effort to clear out and do this kind of landscaping excavation project just to enable the downtown of Kansas City to be built. Much as I was unaware about the same thing with Seattle, and yet they even call these large areas canyons, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it. And perhaps it tells a different story as to what was actually going on in Kansas City in this time. Perhaps really what they were doing was that they were digging out what really remained and what had to be found. Or perhaps it really is, as the historical account gives us, that Father Donnelly was a genius, a jack-of-all-trades, and it would be easier to say what his talents weren't than what they were. However, there are many pictures from many decades that show that there were large bluffs. So it's very difficult to ascertain exactly what was happening. But it provides many different clues, and again, it presents many conflicting accounts. And then we look at the bird's eye map of Kansas City from the 1870s, and we see that it's already grown from the earlier one that we saw from the 1860s, supposedly. Very well-defined grid pattern, which it continues to have to this day. And you can even see the downtown where it runs up to the Missouri River. And you see a very interesting turning bridge as well there. Very intriguing. I suppose it would make sense to allow the riverboat traffic to get through there. We also see, though, that it seems to have a very well-developed infrastructure, even for this early time. We see many massive buildings and structures that have already been completed. And, of course, we'll be told that this was due to the efforts of the early settlers and Father Donnelly and the efforts of the Irish settlers. I wonder if somebody in the comments section is going to tell me that there was some great Irish person who only has one name that built their house that they still live in in Kansas City to this day. I look forward to reading that in the comments to do it today. Well, look at that with that turning bridge. Wonderful technology, and certainly a remarkable engineering achievement for that time. Here's a picture of that bridge. Now, what exactly is this telling us? You can see some of the stone on it. Once again, the stone looks like it's a little older than perhaps it should be, but we'll just explain that away by saying it's the architectural process of rustication. Although, I've been fascinated by how many times that term is used. Other early pictures of Kansas City do sort of give the idea that it was the classic frontier town or the western city that we like to think of when we think of our mythical view of the American West. And yet we see other conflicting aspects in these pictures, many of these structures being made of brick if you look closely. Or perhaps they're made of some other substance that merely resembles brick. Not sure, but you know, again the dating on these photos is always open to question. And here's the Kansas City Stockyards, Kansas City being in the very middle of the American Midwest and being a major intersection point for the compilation and processing of cattle. In fact, this was the second largest stockyard next to Chicago, which was quite legendary. Quite an impressive compound and extremely large with many different structures to it. And if you should ever have the pleasure of dining in 801 Shop House in Kansas City in the Power and Light District, they still have a great picture of this that's posted up there. Very interesting views, though, of the city, because we go from that to suddenly having very advanced buildings and, of course, our electric trolleys. And these ones don't appear to be being pulled by horses, although the road looks awfully muddy there. So, once again, perhaps Father Donnelly and his crew didn't get around to that. 
And then we go a little later and we still see a little bit of a mix of some of the very advanced buildings, like that dome over there. And we see early automobiles. So what's really going on in Kansas City? Well, we seem to have many different accounts, and we also have accounts of many floods that seem to change things around and require a new train station to be built and different buildings to be torn down and rebuilt, and of course our usual story. It seems that every single city in the United States has gone through either a flood, a fire, a tornado, or some combination of these unfortunate disasters. This is an early photo, and you can see the Power and Light building there, a building that we have the pleasure of exploring today as it's still with us. Of course, we'll be told that it's an Art Deco building. Here's the earlier Union Station in Kansas City, not located at the same location as the present Union Station, which is quite an impressive structure. But looking at this old one, we still see it's an impressive structure. And look at all the power line poles there. Ah, yes, here is the individual, I'll be told, who built their house. The legendary Irish man named O'Brien. He has no other name, and I'm sure he built someone's house on the hill. And they'll be telling me all about it in the comments. And here is a picture of the current Union Station in Kansas City. Supposedly built in four years, 1910 to 1914. And it's something I've looked at before on one of the earliest videos on the channel. But I thought it fitting to go back there and explore it in person. And today you'll find that the interstate system, which ties Kansas City to the surrounding cities and allows you easy access to it, allows many beautiful views of an incredible landscape. And you can see that this city is built up on a hill and has a very prominent view. Looking at its impressive skyline to this day, though, we can see that many old world buildings have survived to this day. Although many people argue are these actually old world buildings. Well, the city hall, the county courthouse, which just happen to be located right next to each other. We'll be taking a closer look at those. That's what will greet you as you come into the city and you wander around the power and light district. Now, it should be noted that I decided to go conduct my on-the-ground exploration of Kansas City on the hottest days of the year because I'm dedicated. And not to mention that Kansas City is just a fun place to walk around. Add text. Yes. And there's my little joke there because you have all these little art deco buildings that are located so close to each other. You have a city hall located next to a county courthouse. That's the city hall. On the right's the county courthouse. And you can see that there's no shortage of beautiful architecture. Well, let's start with the New England building, constructed in 1886. And we see the hallmarks of the beautiful architecture, the finest of what will be told by the official historical account of the 19th century, with all the beautiful decorations. And I always love it when they have those protruding corner areas off the building. We'll see other fine stones and beautiful decorations, as though there was no limitation in labor or the ability to decorate and of course we'll be told that there were many fine craftsmen who were just wandering the lands and of course you had priests who were talented in everything from being architects to stonemasons to being able to pave streets oh, and they were also mathematicians and brilliant historians yes all these things are told to us about the wonderful father bernard donnelly and i don't mean to discredit him but that's very interesting you look closely at some of these blocks and you see how large they really are and you have to consider the challenges that whoever really built this went through when they constructed it. And everywhere you look in this city, you see beautiful architecture. There is no shortage of it. You just walk anywhere in the downtown and you'll see that there is a lot of old world architecture that survives. Beautiful and unfiltered. And looking up at this beautiful building, just incredible. I always love looking at these little corner towers that protrude like this. The New York Life Building, built in 1890, and here we see another very large block building, whether it's sandstone, limestone, and we'll be told many different materials for the composition, but very impressive with the columns down there by the very large door and an archway, and I really enjoy that uh, eagle motif there. Very beautiful. And what exactly was the original function or purpose behind this building? We can only speculate. However, it stands today, it's very beautiful, and it seems to be doing quite well. That's certainly not something that you see, though, in many buildings, an eagle statue like that that's just overlooking the doorway. And, of course, we have our windows that look like they were built right in the ground. But anywhere you look, you're going to see any kind of neat architecture in Kansas City, whether you're looking at what's titled as the fire department, interesting with the pediment and these columns here. I'm also impressed by the scale of it. 
Well, they're not going to have any issues with anything happening to their fire department building, that's for sure. But wherever you look in Kansas City, you'll see this kind of architecture in these beautiful old world buildings. It's very impressive. And again, we see the same thing here with the columns and the very large blocks. And even over here on this church with what appears to be a gold-plated tower. I'm reminded of the Iowa State Capitol once again. And this financial holding corporation building whatever you really want to call it, with the many columns. These do not look sectional. And then, of course, that decorative motif up there by the roof. I also noticed there were some areas where they were doing some construction. You could kind of see some of the older pieces of the city. I always find these little areas with this excavation interesting to look at because perhaps there's some clues to be found. Well, now we go to the Power and Light Building in 1931. And apparently Kansas City did not seem to suffer the effects of the Great Depression, or they made the most of it, because we're going to find out that they built a slew of beautiful Art Deco buildings during the height of the Great Depression, no less. So a good two years after the stock market crash, and they managed to throw up this beauty. And this is definitely one of the most beautiful Art Deco buildings I've seen on the exterior. Stepping back from it a little bit, uh, we saw that it had that very unique tower top to it. And we'll take a closer look at that as well. But right now, I just want to focus on some of the decorations on the side of it. And there you can see the tower with the little sun motif on the top of it. All the trimmings of the classic Art Deco building. But then decorated all the way from the bottom to the top floor. It's very intriguing whenever you consider these Art Deco buildings and all the effort that they clearly committed in terms of whoever actually built them because again the Art Deco buildings I always find very questionable I find the year very questionable and this is one of the main decorations that you're going to see on the power and light building very impressive and very beautiful and usually what we'll see with some buildings that they'll tell us are Art Deco but really aren't Art Deco is they tend to lack these beautiful decorations I could not find the exact name of this building that's right next to the power and light building but it's just as beautiful with many of the decorative touches. Not exactly sure what year we're going to be told this was built, but look at this with all the little pediments there above the windows and some of the decorations on the roof line and then even some of the symbols up there. So it continues that wherever you look in Kansas City, you're going to see amazing things such as B&B theaters constructed in 1924. And look at the dome on this with the portal windows. And we've seen those patterns before in other cities that we've looked at that we see in the windows. Very impressive architecture and very beautiful for a theater that was built in the 1920s. Although I suppose it's a little more sensible that something like this was constru constructed in the 1920s when it was the Roaring Twenties, or at least the economy, so we're told by the official historical account, was doing well in the United States. And again, you see little decorations on the side of it. Now walking back down to the west, the Municipal Auditorium built in 1935, again during the height of the so-called Great Depression. Maybe they just should have called it the Great Building Boom in Kansas City. Hmm, interesting symbol. Why does that look familiar? And then we see that they decided to put a couple other symbols on this building because, again, it being the Great Depression, and there was no issue just finding labor and having money to bring in these very giant blocks. Again, I have to ask the question in terms of what kind of material this really is. Is this some sort of concrete? Is this Portland cement? Something about this, again, gives the clue that this is much more enduring cement. And for some reason, I'm once again reminded of Roman concrete. The Jackson County Courthouse, constructed in 1934. Another building built during the Great Depression. And it features a nice statue of Andrew Jackson in front of it. This isn't a county courthouse. This is a county court building extravaganza. And look at the beautiful artwork on the front of this building. Look at these reliefs. Very impressive and very beautiful. Now, while I was actually standing there admiring all this beautiful architecture, it looked like there was a little bit of a property auction going on in the front, but few people attended. This is the previous courthouse in Kansas City, and the one before this was destroyed by a tornado, I suppose not too surprising. But as you can see in this image, it's a very impressive structure itself. So I guess they felt they had to throw up an Art Deco building, and it had to be utterly extravagant. I even like the little tower rook piece there. Look at the detailing above this very large doorway. It definitely gives you the feeling of stepping through a portal as though you're going into some other sort of world. And you see these incredible reliefs above it. And then going up the length of the building. 
Right across the street from it is the Kansas City City Hall, because why not put the City Hall next to the county courthouse? And this was built 1935 to 1937, and we see many of the same hallmarks of the architecture. And once again, during the height of the Great Depression. Although they did manage to finish this, it seems, before the next economic downturn that hit the United States in 1937, but people tend not to talk about that. Franklin Roosevelt was very convincing in his fireside chats. Again, just another incredibly beautiful building with beautiful artistic work all over it as though they had infinite time and resources and during the great depression no less that they were able to establish this i even enjoy the way the steps go up to the top of it it's very intriguing to me though because in the cities that we've looked at so far i haven't exactly seen a county courthouse <laughs> and a city hall that have been located next to each other like this look at the artwork and the relief there's just something otherworldly about this now, if we really had the ability to do this in the 1930s, and we can't do this now, or we opt not to do this now, then how far have we truly fallen? And just for a little contrast, as I was leaving the area, I saw the Richard Bowling Federal Building, and I just wanted to show you uh, what kind of architecture we tend to go with today. Ah, yes, look at that beauty. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender. Resistance is futile. I definitely get those feelings when I look at this building. Well, now Kansas City Union Station finished in 1914 and probably one of the most impressive pieces of architecture in this entire city. One of the most grand Union Stations. And we consider the Union Station we looked at in St. Louis and it was very impressive, a castle-like structure. And yet this is just a mammoth structure that defies simple explanation. This is a train station that was built to replace an earlier train station. And look how incredibly beautiful it is. Look how large it is. And then even all around it, you see other very beautiful structures. And eventually, Liberty Memorial, or the National World War I Memorial, as it's called now. And we see the history behind Union Station in Kansas City. And of course, it was the flood in 1903 that they refer to. And now they talk about how they've commemorated it. And you can see that it's standing up quite well. And it's also very incredibly large. Looking down, though, I see a little bit of a different concrete, though, in the floors that appear to be below the ground. And that's very interesting. And then studying the rest of the building, and of course we have our usual pediments and our decorations, and just appreciating the massive size. But it's when you go inside this building that you're completely blown away. Why do you need to have ceilings that are 90 to 110 feet high? And look at the beautiful decorations on the ceilings and the walls and the large blocks. 1910 to 1914. And then I don't want to forget the floor, which has beautiful patterns on it. And it appears to be an entirely hard surface, whether it's made of granite or some other material that we can't properly identify. Because as I said, looking at enough of these buildings up close and personal, I've started to question all this. I like this little clock here that goes down the main gallery. And of course, we have other beautiful symbols and motifs. And the usual trademark of the very large pillars that are built into the wall. This is all very incredibly impressive. Ah, yes, another one of those clocks that has four I's or four ones instead of the IV on it. And just to give you a better view of the beautiful floor, and this is the main gallery. I couldn't access all of it because there was a convention there, but it gives you an idea of how large it really was. This is where the people waited for their trains. And of course, you know, when you're waiting for a train, you need to have a ceiling that's over 100 feet high and well decorated. So you can look up and imagine that you're in a very large environment. I don't know, perhaps a lot of people were claustrophobic back then. They do have some plans setting up, in, setting up in Union Station, and it gives you the idea that, once again, perhaps this was recorded? I don't know. I mean, I guess you only need two perspectives to really be able to effectively design a building. I examined some of the blocks and noticed some of the construction behind them, and you can see some of the concrete is cracking. But it's very interesting that a lot of the concrete, or whatever this building is truly made of, is standing up very well. It's over 100 years old. Well, since it was 102 degrees that day, I decided it would be fun to just uh, skip up the stairs and go to the Liberty Memorial. Now, I call it the Liberty Memorial because that's what it was originally called, the giant tower that you see there in the distance, well over 200 feet tall and a very impressive structure in and of itself, the monument that was dedicated to the veterans of World War I in the United States. They supposedly completed it in 1926, although there's conflicting accounts on that, and you can find construction photos, but make of them what you will. 
I was still very impressed though by the structure, and since the temperature being what it was, I pretty much had the entire structure to myself. Ah uh, yes, the IRS Tax Center. Beautiful building with some great pillars in it. I'm not going to bother looking up uh, what the stated date on that is because, well, let's just say I question it, even if it's well documented. Look at this beautiful relief though here on the front of the Liberty Memorial. Very interesting and very intriguing with the detail that you see behind this. And once again, I mean, I see some figures that look like they could be soldiers from World War I, but we see a lot of other questioning figures on that. Interesting relief. Ascending the stairs, you go up onto the main memorial itself, and you see the great giant tower. And I'm not sure how many stairs I climbed at this point, but I made it. And we have a couple sphinxes that have wings over their eyes, because apparently they're covering their eyes from the terror of the war to end all wars, and we saw how accurate that was. And then, of course, you have the main tower, which is in the center. Now, it should be noted that underneath this tower is where the actual World War I museum is located. Yes, as though they added that as an afterthought. And it should be noted that this was funded by local prominent citizens in Kansas City, and then, of course, from donations. And you see you have a great view of Union Station and the downtown of Kansas City. And this just gives you an idea of how large Union Station is, as you can see the vehicles parked near it. And there on the left, you can see the power and light building that we looked at earlier. You can see the county courthouse and the city hall. <laughs> and some other very impressive buildings that continue with us today. And of course, they've surrounded them by the beautiful postmodern brutalist buildings that we prefer today. Looking up at this tower, though, you can see one of the giant guardian figures. Well... At least we know Kansas City would never rename their sports team to a Guardian. This is a mystery building that I found near the Arts Center, and there'll be a special members video that's going to cover what this building's all about. We see a couple signs of old world architecture, but there's actually a lot more behind this building. It's a very intriguing story, and it certainly reinforces the narrative that someone might be trying to mislead us on our explorations, and I can't imagine why anybody would do that. And now we look at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, built in 1933. Yet another incredibly beautiful building that was built during the Great Depression. And of course, we're told that it's from the generous efforts of a couple real estate developers in Kansas City, Nelson, a gentleman, and Atkins, a lady, who decided to devote their funds to build this incredibly beautiful gallery of art, which, of course, has columns, and on the inside, you find that it's an even more beautiful building. Marble columns, which I checked and confirmed that these are all marble, at least what we think of as marble. Very beautiful floor and beautiful skylights. Now, I find it fascinating that this building is filled with beautiful artwork, because it's almost as though you come there to see the artwork, and you'll miss the architecture if you're not really paying attention to it. And I look and I see all this incredibly beautiful architecture and art mixed on the inside of this building. Very impressive entryway too. When you look at the roof and the walls, it's unbelievably beautiful and it's almost as though you're going into some kind of old church. And yet this was supposedly built in the 1930s. And look at some of the beautiful detail here on the entryway by this very large door. Once again, I mean, I understand that this is supposedly an art gallery, but we were building this in Kansas City at the same time we were building all these other buildings. I went in and looked at some of the paintings because I was impressed by what I saw, and once again, it's almost as though you have a different technique with the painting. They seem so lifelike with the faces and the depictions. And this is the August the Strong, Elector of Saxony. And I looked at some of these other paintings, and while they're supposedly from the 18th century, we see ruins in them. A little pyramid there with the pediment and some columns on it. And then over here in this painting, more ruins. So very intriguing that they're depicting ruins and then some large structure there in the background. And of course, when you look up what these paintings are really about and what they're depicting, they'll always give you some explanation. But again, I wonder if this is just something where we just write something down and then people who like to say, well, it's very well documented, so I'm just going to believe what I'm told and that's good enough for me. Even if, you know, one county's well-documented history completely conflicts with another county's well-documented history, I'm sure somebody got it right. Isn't this intriguing here? Very, very beautiful, and another painting depicting what appear to be very advanced building construction techniques with many arches, a beautiful clock, and of course, no shortage of columns. And I suppose you can explain this away. Look at that building there onto the left. And what's the detail behind this one? 
the clock tower in the Piazza San Marco, 1728. And, you know, it wouldn't be a complete set of paintings to look at unless we found a couple domes with some beautiful towers on them and some very ornate architecture. I'm going to guess this is Venice, but I could be wrong. Very beautiful. And once again, someone to be seeing this and painting it is quite incredible to me. Ah, uh, yes. And then looking at some other paintings, you can see the same details. A little structure in the background there. But then also pulling out, I just wanted to show you that this is a painting that's on a wall here in the art gallery. Just surrounded by marble. So... I'm beginning to wonder exactly what's the original purpose and intention of this building. I mean, we can accept that it was built in the 1930s and that all these incredible works of art just happen to end up on it. But I'd like to hear your comments and your opinions on what you think this is. Look at how beautiful this entryway is. Well, I'll close out with the Kansas City Country Club Plaza, supposedly built in the 1920s, opened in 1924, 1925, depending what account you look at. And you have some very beautiful structures that are supposedly reminiscent of wonderful structures in Spain. As though, once again, the 1920s, well, again, at least we were in an economic boom, the Roaring Twenties, you can see some of this beautiful architecture in Kansas City. And it's quite incredible when you look at the little details on this. And this was just supposed to be an imitation architecture, yet this is coming up on 100 years old, and it's still holding up this well. The Country Club Plaza, a very beautiful place to visit, and of course what Kansas City will tell you it's for is for shopping. They just happen to throw some beautiful architecture up in it because, you know, they had nothing better to do with their time. And this is where Kansas City got the title of City of the Fountains because this is where you'll find many of the beautiful fountains as well. So once again, more conflicting accounts, and yet many beautiful towers, beautiful buildings with beautiful decoration on it, all to build a shopping center. I mean, oh yeah, look at that little face up there. Isn't that very intriguing? I even like the little beard and the mustache, so what's that really depicting? Everywhere you look, ah uh, yes, we have another little dome here. And a very well-developed tower on that. There's just nowhere you can go in Kansas City without seeing incredible beauty and what appears to be vast, copious amounts of old world architecture everywhere you look. That defies simple explanation. And... I'll be honest, despite the fact that it was over 100 degrees, I enjoyed every minute that I was in Kansas City. Just to be able to see these incredible, beautiful works of art and these beautiful buildings. However, there was just one slight issue with Kansas City. No well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. All right, so a little location context. Let's review the cities that we've already explored here on the Restitutor Orbis channel. We've looked at Chicago, or Shilaga as we called it. We've done our initial exploration of New York, although there's many to follow there. We've looked at Philadelphia, and we've got several explorations, including boots on the ground to follow there. We've explored Cincinnati, Louisville, St. Louis, and now we're working our way back to Indianapolis. Here's the interesting thing about Indianapolis and why we start by looking at it on the map. Now you notice that most of the other cities you can see the pattern of the interstates around them and you have a lot of east-west access but not as much north-south access which is intriguing to me. What's really unique about Indianapolis though is just the way all the roads seem to circuit right into it as though it was some sort of major intersection point for some potential previous civilization. And that's why we say it's an old world city of intersection. Indianapolis is very unique in that respect. 
And when we take a look at the very center of the city, which you can actually see when you look at the aerial imagery of it, the very center of Indianapolis really stands out. And you can see the square very, very easy and how all the roads seem to run right here to the center point, which is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which we're told was constructed from 1888 to 1901 circa, if we're to believe that. So it's a very interesting account that we have of Indianapolis. And Indianapolis is a place that is unique, and the roads do seem to circuit into it. And how old are those roads, and what's the true history behind it? Well, those are some of the questions we're going to try to answer in this exploration. So we have our standard settling story for Indiana, and Indianapolis is quite intriguing because in 1816, the year that Indiana gained statehood, they supposedly already had the land allocated for the new state capital was going to be, at least the site determined in 1820. Then we're told that uh, some initial families showed up there, the McCormicks and the Pogues, I believe that's how you pronounce it, and no, I'm not joking about it, that's what it says, the Pogues. However, what's intriguing is the fact that uh, there really doesn't seem to be any kind of growth or history at that point until the United States Civil War, which, of course, seems to be the starting point for a lot of things. So they were there, that family showed up, a railroad went through, a national road went through in 1827, but really no other historical events seemed to happen until the United States Civil War. And then after the Civil War, we had the Second Industrial Revolution, and suddenly Indianapolis was a boomtown. It went from about 2,000 to 6,000 people from 1850 to 1860, and then by 1890, they were over 100,000, and by 1920, over 300,000. Massive rapid growth, which of course will be told is immigration. It always is. Very intriguing background, and yet it's the same hand wave story that we should have more history, especially given Indiana and Indianapolis's relative location to the other states and major cities that were developing at this time. But we really don't have anything. Let's take a look at some pictures. Not surprisingly, one of the early pictures we have of Indianapolis shows us a picture of a Confederate prisoner of war camp. We're told that prisoners of war during the United States Civil War suffered grievously on both sides, and we see some temporary structures here, a little bit of a tent. It's very interesting, though, how there doesn't seem to be any guard towers or anything, but I don't know, maybe the prospect was no one was going to escape anywhere anyway. Here's our classic uh, 1860s, 1870s uh, picture, a drawn picture, bird's eye view, with some of the major structures at the time. We're not going to examine this too much, though, because, frankly, anybody could have drawn these structures. They may have existed, they may not. It's surprising, though, that they're depicting the city so built out, since we're told that it really hadn't started until 1865, after the U.S. Civil War with the Second Industrial Revolution. Here we see the plat of Indianapolis. This is the plot and drawing and design of the downtown of Indianapolis, but we have to wonder, is this really a design, or is this merely a recording? There's something about this image that makes us feel like it's a recording because of how well laid out everything is. And here in the middle we see the central layout of the downtown of Indianapolis where all the roads would run to. And we see that in the very middle in the circle was originally the governor's house. We're going to take a look at a drawn picture of the governor's house. Of course we don't have a picture of it. Surprise, surprise. But it's very fortuitous that that particular plot of land right in the middle of the city just happened to be large enough to fit a very large monument that they were going to build, or were told that they built, in 1888 to 1901. Very intriguing and very convenient that it just happened to fit there. Why would the governor want to live in the middle of the capital city anyway? It doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? It's not something you hear of in any other city. Usually the governor lives off in a you know, distant district and commutes to work at the state capital. At least that's what one would expect, but maybe I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt. So that's the plat of Indianapolis. And yet we have another interesting image. This is supposedly from 1871, our bird's eye view. Again, we're surprised to see the city so built out because we're told that Indianapolis only had about 8,000 people in the 1860s. Although who knows on those numbers, we can look up the demographics and try to extrapolate what they actually are. But look how built out this is for a rendering from 1871. And you can already see the same pattern that we saw on the plat and we saw on the map earlier with the layout of the very downtown of Indianapolis. What do we see in the middle of the circle here? It almost looks like a large tower structure there from this 1871 rendering, as though the monument were already there. 
unless we're to believe the governor's house was some massive structure, but we'll see in the picture that it most certainly was not. Again, this is something that's raising more questions than it's answering. What exactly was going on in Indianapolis? And we have to wonder if we have a little bit more evidence, potentially, of something that was founded. On that note, this is a photograph from 1888, and we already see a very well-built-out city. We have our classic towers, our pediments, our pediments, our arches. Very well-built-out, incredible buildings in 1888 for a city that really hadn't been around for over 30 years and we're told grew up rapidly after the Civil War, it must have grew up really rapidly. That second Industrial Revolution did it all. How many other Industrial Revolutions do they have after that? Well, here's our photo from the early 20th century, circa 1911 to 1914. You get conflicting accounts in that as well. And again, you see this very built-out city. We see the state capitol off to the left, fully complete. See some other very massive buildings. And again, it's the same story that we saw when we looked at Louisville, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. Everything's always very well built out at the start of the 20th century. The tremendous accomplishments. We also think about at this time that Seattle was going through their massive regrading or excavation project where they were just leveling hills. Really, they could do anything at the start of the 20th century. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised anymore. Here is the modern photo from the 1940s of the downtown of Indianapolis where we see the monument circle and the completed monument, so we're told, in 1901 standing. Very beautiful and a lot of incredible buildings that we're going to take a closer look at, especially the monument itself as it has such an intriguing story. One final note before we start looking at specific structures in Indianapolis, apparently there's some ruins in a park that they picked up from a building that was torn down in New York City. And that's something else we're going to take a look at. Nice columns and what exactly is going on there? Again, more questions than answers. So let's take a look at our state houses or state capitals for Indiana. And here's the first one built in 1813 and then they moved out of it in 1824 or so we're told. Building still stands and is preserved today. So it's built uh, much better than a lot of the houses we have today. Although this was a state capital, we'd expect that. It's intriguing that they moved the state capital to Indianapolis in 1824 because we're also told that there really wasn't anybody there yet. But I guess that was their designated area for the state capital, so they had to get to their designated area. This is the second building, supposedly modeled after the Greek Parthenon. Although we don't really have a solid year of construction, and all we know is that it was condemned in the 1870s. Very vague details on this, and rather vague picture. I don't know, Parthenon or not. Parthenon Nashville looks more like a Parthenon. And here is the fifth state capital in the current state capital of Indianapolis, built from 1880 to 1888. Now, they say they completed the Capitol Dome in 1883, so really, was that only three years to really build the major portions of this incredible edifice? I don't know. The only thing that does make sense about this is the fact that they did actually use Indiana limestone, which is nearby, and this is probably one of the rare cases of a state capital being constructed of material that's actually in the state. Some of the materials they say they got for some of the other state capitals were in the state, but this is one that we're told, and it makes sense, that it's Indiana limestone, you know, except for the limestone that they sent to New York City and other far-off locations. Anyway, I digress. Very beautiful building. Not a five-domer, but nice tower, or excuse me, nice dome. And then they've got uh, four subsidiary structures. And, of course, we have our classic pediment and our beautiful columns. And then, of course, the incredible base stones. It is very beautiful. And for something from the 19th century, it stands out. And I wonder if we could do something like this today. Let's take a look at the interior. Gorgeous interior. Lots of internal columns. Again, I would just love to see some interior construction photos. And I recall one of the many naysayers that you'll come across in certain other forms of social media, and they'll always tell you, a state capital just looks like a standard municipal government building. It's really boring. Well, except for this couple who found it beautiful enough to get married in. And we can see why. Maybe it was a choice between this and driving down to Louisville to go get married at the water tower there. Remember when we looked at that? Yeah, that was quite a beauty. Again, just the gorgeous details and nothing spared in this beautiful state capitol building. We always get that sense of awe and inspiration whenever we see the interiors of these buildings, and that's why I think it's important to look at them, because actually going into these buildings is really where you feel the immense positive energy with them. 
And maybe that's just looking at the gorgeous decorative detail in all the columns. And I would just really like to see an interior construction photo, along with the skylights, how they put all that in, how they manage to lift all those columns to the second, to the third level. It's just beautiful and gorgeous. And that's always something you have whenever you look at a state capitol. I can't really say that this is one of the most beautiful state capitals that I've seen, but it's up there. And this is looking up in the dome, and that's a beautiful and unique look within the dome. And please, residents or residents of Indiana or Indianapolis, I'm not bringing down the state capitol. It's very beautiful, and I don't think there's any chance that we could build a building like this today. This is just gorgeous, and I could see why someone would want to get married here. And for anybody who's been married, you know that venue for your wedding is a very tricky subject. But just a gorgeous location and something that looks otherworldly. Beautiful. Now we take a look at the Indiana Soldier and Sailors Monument for the United States Civil War. And this is the real centerpiece of Indianapolis. This is the governor's house, a little two-story, modest building that was supposedly in that circle that we saw in the 1871 map. Certainly not that large edifice that was depicted there or that structure. This is the only construction photo that you're going to actually get of the Soldier and Sailor's Monument. Yes, a lot of scaffolding. They placed the cornerstone, and why would you suddenly build up the scaffolding? It doesn't look like there's anything in there. Very mysterious. Supposedly, there was a competition in 1888 to decide who was going to design this, and naturally the competition was won, and then they spent the next 13 years building this incredible structure. Here is the dedication ceremony in 1901, and we're told that it was attended by many people, which in this picture we see many people, and some gorgeous buildings around them in the downtown of Indianapolis in the early 20th century. Here's what the monument looks like in all its glory, 270 feet tall, 274 feet tall. Beautiful. And it's the centerpiece of Indianapolis. We have to wonder if this monument could have some other meanings. I mean, it's certainly a very worthy monument to Civil War veterans. In fact, I wonder if veterans from other wars in the United States don't wonder why they don't get a monument like this. This is an intriguing photo. What exactly is going on here? We know that they established an underground museum below this Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis. And I'll also comment that this is one of the tallest, if not the tallest, monuments for veterans in the United States at 274 feet. Here's the underground museum that's beneath the monument. Very interesting that they could just suddenly throw that in there as well, as though they'd had that planned from the start, although we're told that it was something that was added later. So going into the foundation of a very large monument that took 13 years to build is not a problem at all. It's very beautiful and it's something that must signify something that we don't fully understand if this is indeed the remnant of an old world civilization. And I know what I'm saying could be somewhat contentious. It is a very beautiful monument and I wonder if it was already there and it was modified to recognize the Civil War veterans of Indiana. If we did do this, I wish there were more construction photos that really depicted this, because this is an incredible structure, an amazing achievement. Why is the only photo we have of it just some scaffolding? And then looking here from the ground looking up, and you get an idea of just how large and immense this is, along with all the reliefs on it. Now, I recall the Iowa Soldier and Sailors Monument, and it certainly does not compare to this. While Iowa may have the five-dome capital, they do not have an incredible monument that matches this. Interestingly enough, this is a rendering of what the monument would look like when it was completed in 1888, and it wasn't finished until 1901. Very interesting that this photo rendering... It's not a photo, but <laughs> it looks as though it's as accurate as though someone sat and drew it. Now, you could argue that maybe it was drawn later. I don't know. It's all very intriguing, and it raises more questions than it answers again. Now we go to the Indiana World War Memorial Building. This is another Art Deco building, although we're told it was started construction in the 1920s, and then they had some challenges with it and didn't really finish it until the 1940s, although they dedicated the exterior in the early 1930s. General Pershing himself laid the cornerstone in the late 1920s. 
And yes, this is another building that is modeled after the mausoleum of Heliconarsis, just like the Civil Court building in St. Louis, built at the same time. I guess there was a run on ripping off Ancient Wonders of the World. Here's a better view of it where you can see that pyramid top. And interestingly enough, there's a fountain here that shows some, well, perhaps some inappropriate uh, pictures or inappropriate depictions of children and a lady dancing. They're not fully clad. The memorial has some beautiful aspects to it. You see this incredible lion here. Not something that you'll see in some of the other uh, war monuments, but I really enjoy this. And you can see some of the columns as part of the memorial building itself. It's quite beautiful. And yet they tell us that this thing was already starting to deteriorate in the late 1940s, even though they just completed it in 1933. Again, conflicting accounts. Here's another view of that uh, magnificent lion. Nice little shield on his chest there. And one wonders why there were so many lions depicted. You see them in buildings, and you see them in government buildings, and they show up a lot more than we tend to realize. I wonder if a lion was potentially a symbol or something that really mattered in the old civilization. And this is a nice statue that looks like it was potentially added on a little bit later. And here you can see the World War Memorial Building with the beautiful columns as part of the wall. And I've surmised in other videos or theorized that the Art Deco construction, as we call it, was simply a later construction type in the previous civilization. Look at the interior of this building. Look at this theater and the gorgeous beauty in those columns and the decoration on the ceiling. And this is a theater. This is just incredible. All this in a memorial, and I'm not suggesting that the veterans don't deserve something beautiful and gorgeous like this, but this is certainly not something that uh, you would see done for today's veterans. They tend to just get a little marble wall with their names inscribed in them, sort of like from Vietnam onwards. But the World War veterans and the Civil War veterans in Indiana, they certainly got all that they deserved with these incredible monuments. Although, I wonder how many of them would have preferred just having a genuine guaranteed pension for the rest of their lives. Regardless, it's such a beautiful building. And there's so much detail to it. I had no idea that this existed in Indianapolis. And I mean, look at the ceiling on this and the floor. And then you see more of the gorgeous columns. They really didn't undercut the construction of this building at all. And if this was something we did, then why was it already deteriorating so quickly in the 1940s? This doesn't look like this is anything that would deteriorate over any amount of time. And here's the center of the building. And again, you see the columns. And just look at the ceiling and the detail. How does any of this look like it would ever deteriorate within a thousand years? I find it very challenging to believe that that is indeed the case. And yet that's what we're told. Here is supposedly some of the renovation that they're doing. Perhaps someday in the future they're going to say that this is a legitimate construction photo of this incredible edifice. And they're going to say that it was built in, oh, you know, whatever dating system they come up with after the next reset. And on to Indianapolis Union Station. We're told that the original one was built sometime in the 1860s, although since we don't really have a picture of it, can't really verify its existence. But we have this nice drawing of it. However, I'm not really going to concern myself with doing the research for the exact date because it doesn't really matter as that building is no longer standing. But here's the one that's currently standing, and we're told this was built in 1888. Very beautiful building. Look at that beautiful round window. I love the large clock tower, and there's many similar styling cues that we saw to Union Station in St. Louis. But this is Indianapolis's Union Station, and it has its own array of beauty. And look how large the facility is behind it. Why do you need a terminal this large or this extensive for trains? Trains typically operate outside, and I understand you need organized passengers. However, we always have these very large and elaborate terminals. And the beautiful window is something that really causes this one to stand out. It's almost as though this could have been some sort of religious building or a church or designated something else. And here's another look at that incredible round window, which is typically what you see associated with some sort of large cathedral or basilica. 
And then we've got the large clock tower and people will say, well, they needed to see what time it was because in 1888, nobody had pocket watches. Even though Waltham Watch Company was making tens of thousands of watches since the end of the Civil War, and every rail worker had a watch, or so we're told. But who knows what reality is. Here's another view of the entire compound of Union Station in Indianapolis. And here again, you just see how extensive and large this all is. Quite amazing that they had these kind of facilities for these trains. And of course, everyone will tell us, well, that shouldn't be surprising. Then you look at the interior of Union Station, and here you see something that looks like it's almost out of the subway in New York City from the early 20th century. But we're told this was built in 1888. Very beautiful, and it looks like it's very ahead of its time, especially with the pillars there. And I like the nice detail with what looks to be tiling. I'm not sure. This is definitely a building I would like to go to, though, and explore the interior of and really ascertain what exactly these materials are. This is truly beautiful, though, this main hall looking out the window. This is where you see otherworldly detail, especially in these arches. And look at the ceiling. Again, we're just supposed to believe that they just took the extra time in the late 19th century in a train station in Indianapolis to insert all of this detail. We don't really even have a construction timeline for this building, and even if we did, we'd probably be told it was done in, oh, a year or two years. It didn't take this long. There were skilled artisans all over the nation. This window and this entire layout on the inside of Indianapolis Union Station is truly gorgeous. And it's something that I could see them using as a set for a science fiction movie, a fantasy movie, even an alternate timeline movie. When you start to think in terms like that, you realize all the wonders that are truly present across the land. The Scottish Rite Cathedral, built 1927 to 1929, and is one of the largest Masonic buildings in the world, if not the largest Masonic building in the world. In fact, it's so beautiful they consider this neo-Gothic architecture. Although, I think I might consider this Gotham City architecture. I don't know how you'd classify this. Traditionally, you'd think they'd call this Art Deco, but Neo-Gothic? I don't see how you could classify it that way either. This is an incredibly beautiful building. And this building has more ornate detail and beauty than you see in many cathedrals. And I think calling it a cathedral is very appropriate. Look at the tower. The archway and the incredibly long windows. Both the window with the window pane and then the carved out windows higher in the tower and just the amount of detail that went into it 1927 to 1929 uh, I would love to see construction photos of this and I mean look at the subsidiary towers the entryway door with the multiple arches within it and just the stairway leading up to it it's as though no detail was spared in constructing this beautiful cathedral and really you could call this building anything and it wouldn't seem inappropriate. Is it a palace? Is it a cathedral? Is it some sort of royal reception area? <laughs> Calling it a state capital? Yes, we could probably call it a state capital. We could call it a city hall. Although, I don't know, a city hall doesn't seem like it quite matches what this building is. A very incredible and beautiful building on the exterior. But in the interior, look at this. On the ceiling, look at this elaborate and beautiful detail. And again, it's looking on the inside of these buildings. I would really love to see interior construction photos and how this was all done. And remember, this is later in the United States history, or so we're told, 1927 to 1929. Where were all those craftsmen and artisans? And look at this. Just incredible beauty and detail in just the slightest areas where you'd see that no expense was truly spared. You can see why this is one of the largest Masonic buildings in the world, but it's also one of the most beautiful on the inside. Colored windows, and I like the reflection on that too. You can just imagine being inside a building like this and how it would reach you on the inside and make you feel inspired, and the world is such a beautiful place, all from just being inside a building. And look at this. The doors and the floor, I think that's a granite floor. Definitely another building I would like to look on the inside and really determine what the materials are. But this is just such a beautiful building, both inside and outside. 
I'm always left wondering why it is we don't do more buildings like this. Look at this doorway and all the windows there and the chandelier. Just incredible. And even between the doorways, too. As though not a single inch was spared. The inspiration of beauty and the touch of artistic flair. Unreal. This is the, National, this is the Surgical National Surgical Institute, a hospital that was supposedly built in the mid-1890s in Indianapolis. Four-story modern facility, or so we're told. Very beautiful building, and it was built after the last one, I know you'll never guess, was destroyed in a fire. Although, strangely enough, the individual who managed it didn't do a very good job, or so we're told, and then the person he left in charge of it didn't do a very good job either. So it was sold off, and it became a very large hotel called the Imperial Hotel. And then, unfortunately, it was raised between 1945 and 1949. Gorgeous building, very unique detail for a hospital. And here are a compilation of photos that we found from this National Surgical Institute hospital from the mid-1890s in Indianapolis. And look at the gorgeous tower there. Yes, a state-of-the-art building built in the mid-1890s that looks like that for a hospital. These are intriguing photos, and they seem to portray a different picture than what we'd expect to see in Indianapolis in the 1890s. Just gorgeous detail on this building itself, and then some of the other buildings that we see, looking out at what looks to be the state capitol right there. What a view they had, and look at the handrail. I had never really heard of this building, and look at the pillars right there, the columns. That's supporting the beam. I wish we had more pictures of the interior, but this has to be one of the most ornate and beautiful and well-decorated hospitals I think I've ever seen in my life from any era. And then here you can see the Soldier and Sailors Monument from this hospital. Quite a gorgeous sight. And we wonder, what was the original purpose of this building? Because clearly, nobody builds a hospital that looks like this. At last, we reach Tomlinson Hall, built 1883 to 1886. Three years for this incredible facility that was so large and a main venue for many events. And it was destroyed, you'll never guess, by a fire. Apparently from a cigarette dropped by a pigeon in 1956. I wish I were joking, but that's the official count that we're given. A pigeon bombed it with a lit cigarette in 1956. Tomlinson Hall is interesting to us, though, because the catacombs underneath it are still intact and you can still visit them to this day. An underground beneath Indianapolis. And you may recall seeing these images before if you're a longtime watcher of the channel when we did the underground horror video. It's one of the very early videos on the Restitutor Orbis channel, speculating about what happened to the previous civilization's people and how they were taken, ordered, tricked to going underground where terrible things happened to them. There's a lot of strange accounts with Tomlinson Hall's catacombs, and it's considered a place that you can explore. This is all that's left of Tomlinson Hall. Somehow this building burned down when a pigeon dropped a lit cigarette on it. Yes, that is exactly what we're told. I'm just relaying the account to you. And I'm sure there are people out there that will tell us that we're fools for questioning the account. Of course, a pigeon dropping a lit cigarette could destroy a brick building with a fire. What are you thinking? There's a very strange and eerie feeling, though, when you look at these catacombs and you see the detail within them. And it might not be the best spot to end this exploration on Indianapolis with, but there's so many other things to consider with this beautiful city. And I believe there's more to explore here. And it's been a joy and a pleasure to look at all the beauty of Indianapolis. And this is definitely a city worth visiting anytime. Consider joining the channel as a member. You can be an explorer and receive early access to content. Or you can be a prime explorer and have exclusive content that you can't watch on the regular channel. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for joining me today.
Welcome to the Restitute Orbis channel and thank you for joining me for today's exploration of Detroit. Just to go back at some of the cities that we've looked at recently here on the Restitute Orbis channel, most recently we looked at Indianapolis and we started our city explorations with Chicago and now we're heading to Detroit. Detroit is the interesting city sitting right at the major intersection point between Ontario and Michigan in Canada and the United States respectively. Interestingly enough about Detroit is that it was originally supposedly settled by the Mound Builders, the legendary Native American civilization that existed in this area. We've come across them before in the historical account. It was also originally settled by a French settler or explorer, or an explorer who had settlers hanging out with him in 1701, a gentleman by the name of Cadillac. And yes, I'm going to pronounce it that way because that's how it's pronounced currently. Don't you feel me, people of the great city of Louisville? Did I get that right? In any event, Looking at Detroit, we see where it sits, and it's quite an interesting city with a very unique history. And of course, we'll look in depth at that history. One of our major points of interest, though, is Michigan Central, which is a train station, interesting enough, not called Union Station. And we see where it sits right here on the tracks, and we'll go to our aerial imagery. And we see what an incredible building it is, and currently it's being renovated. Detroit has quite a colored history in United States parlance, because in the 1980s, I recall many people talking about how Detroit was the murder capital. There's even a line about it in the famous Goonies movie. In any event, the city has come a long way now, and now it's being restored, but it has a very rich and textured history, and for our purposes, very many allusions to the old world. You can see here the train tracks and how they run into this little tunnel, and the tunnel goes right underneath what they call the Detroit River, and then it runs over into Windsor, which is in Canada, and the trains come or the train tracks come back up there. It's about 1.6 miles that this tunnel runs under. It's one of the first things we'll be taking a look at. One other interesting thing about Detroit is that it was featured quite prominently in the War of 1812. It's not one of the U.S. Army's finer moments, as one of the greatest surrenders in U.S. Army history occurred here and during the War of 1812, and General Hull surrendered to a vastly inferior force. And he was court-martialed to be shot, but fortunately pardoned by General or President Madison at the time. And then there was a subsequent de defeat in the Battle of Frenchtown. But fortunately, the U.S. Navy was up to the task, and Oliver Hazard Perry managed to liberate Detroit or bring it back under U.S. control when he won the Battle of the Great Lakes. All right, let's get into the exploration of Detroit. So here's our initial renderings of Detroit, or drawings as it were, when it was just a fort, and we presume this to be sometime 1790, so therefore these are the fortifications at the disposal of General William Hull when he attempted to defend it from the vastly inferior besieging force of British, Canadian militia, and Native Americans that attacked him. Word on the grapevine was that the reason he surrendered was the fact that he lacked proper munitions, and that he also feared a Native American massacre. I guess he never heard of what happened to Colonel Monroe and his force when he surrendered Fort William Henry Harrison to a combined force of French and Native Americans. Regardless, we see the typical layout of a star fort, and then we see an outer wall. We also see that the concept of the star fort has always been labeled with the historical depictions of the city. What kind of accuracy is that in these depictions? We have no idea because once again, these are drawings. These are not pictures. So do these really prove anything? No. These prove that someone can draw some great pictures and that's about it. Now these could be accurate. They may not be accurate. But to new viewers of the channel, we always ask these questions because these drawings don't prove anything, and as we know, images and pictures don't necessarily prove anything, although they can provide clues, and that's how we approach these explorations. We see that it's an interesting dichotomy in the two layouts that we've looked at already, where we have the star fort away from the initial settlement, and then we look at a subsequent plan of Detroit, where we see the way that all the streets run away from the Detroit River. And we see that that's considered one of the base designs, and this seems to be building out the city even more. Isn't it interesting how they had this kind of intricate planning already as part of the design this early in the time frame? Now, this plan of Detroit is supposedly from the early 19th century, although, again, I always question the years on the references with these aspects, because really they can assign whatever year they want to to it. Now, if you're content to believe whatever the historical account tells you, well, that's fine. You can believe that, and you, know, you don't want to ask any questions. This is a latter picture of Detroit, and we see the same layout in the 1870s. Again, just another rendering or drawing, which could be done by anyone at any time. We see some more buildings, and yet we still see the same pattern in the build-out to the neighborhoods and many of the buildings on the Detroit River. 
We also see a lot of naval traffic, which makes sense as this is in between the Great Lakes. Although the Great Lakes themselves are very interesting as due to the fact that they are not depicted on earlier maps of North America at all. But of course, we'll explain that by saying those cartographers from that time frame had no idea what they were doing, and maybe the explorers just couldn't miss a Great Lake. Or maybe they didn't report a Great Lake and therefore it didn't end up on the maps. This is the Detroit Soldiers and Sailors Monument, their monument to the United States Civil War that was built in the early 1870s, so they were a little bit earlier to the game. While it may not compare in height and just simple magnitude to the one that we looked at in Indianapolis, it's still very beautiful. I find it interesting that they put what appears to be, or what they state, is a Native American princess, I suppose, or some sort of warrior on top of this monument for the United States Civil War. Fascinating. Although when we look at her a little closely, she looks like she's a member of the Union Army Valkyrie Regiment, who the Confederates feared greatly when they fought in the South. Now, I'm being a little facetious, but again, it's one of these very questionable monuments, and it causes me to question exactly what they're depicting here. And why do we always see this depictions of things that don't really make a lot of sense? Why would they represent a Native American woman on top of a monument to Civil War veterans? And supposedly this was completed in the early 1870s, 1872, if records are to be believed. And that's only seven short years after the Civil War. Most of the other monuments were completed in the 1880s or the 1890s as though the United States Civil War was not to be recognized until a few decades had passed. And here's how the monument looks in one of the earlier pictures that we have of Detroit from the early 20th century. And we see the typical traffic that we'd expect to see in a very magnificent building and a very well built out city block with many lines on it. So an early photograph that gives us some clues that there may have been existing structures here that had always been here, unless we want to go with the historical account that these were all built by the great people of Detroit and that they had done so after the Civil War. Of course, the tall building across from the monument, we'll be told, was constructed sometime in the 1890s, which was when skyscrapers suddenly became available and the ability to build multi-story buildings was something easy. I always enjoyed this sign to Detroit. Welcome to Detroit, the Renaissance City, founded in 1701. That's right, Cadillac just founded it, right? Isn't it funny how we always see that term? And it's even more fitting that this sign is depicted right next to this amazing building. You'll never guess what this amazing, beautiful building is, as you see the pediment and the incredible tower. Although, frequent viewers of the channel who've been part of the other city explorations will probably have a good idea of what this building is and what it represents. Eh, if only we had such facilities available today, imagine the things that we could achieve. I guarantee you that your mail would never be late. And mail isn't late anymore, is it? Here's the Detroit Opera House, and isn't it intriguing that we have this kind of building for an opera house? Why do we not have opera houses in every city anymore, or every town? It's also interesting when you think about the fact that there's some very small towns across the Midwest United States that have their own opera house. I think the smallest town I've ever been in is a town called Manterville in Minnesota. It barely breaches a thousand people, if census records are to be believed, and it has its own opera house. So, I mean, if a little town like that can have its own opera house, well, why doesn't every town have its own opera house? I mean, the opera may be in town, and you know, imagine what everybody could do for the time being. Here's another photograph uh, looking in Detroit in the late, or excuse me, in the 1890s. Again, if the time frame from the photo is to be accepted. And we see some very well built out buildings with some great detail in them. And we have the usual interest in detail on the streets. I mean, do we see the tracks? Is this a brick street? Is this a paved street? Hard to tell for sure. Although we see the uh, horse and buggies parked very well, almost like they're cars in a way. And we see a little bit of activity with some people walking around. So clearly this is not from a time when photographs could not capture the activity of people in town. And it's quite telling that we actually see some people walking around. Here's a more sweeping panorama of that same block in the same time frame and our first look at the City Hall, which we'll be taking a look at later, along with the building and the monument that we saw earlier. And I always found this to be a very telling photo of early Detroit, because it gives us the impression that there's a lot more build-out already in this city. Now we can say, well, it was originally founded in 1701, they had plenty of time, they could have built these buildings, and yes, those factors are true. But I always find it very interesting in terms of how fast the ability to construct buildings like this progressed in the 19th century. And I don't think Detroit's any exception with the way it depicts this in these images that we see. 
Now, I fully accept that we don't know the exact years on these photos. We only have years that are assigned to them by either whatever Department of History we're interfacing with or the university that keeps them in official records or, of course, our own government records, which we know that we can trust beyond any shadow of a doubt. And now we're looking at the central tunnel that we looked at earlier on the map that runs as part of the railroad. Now they constructed this from 1906 to 1910, or excuse me, 1906 to 1910, an underground tunnel that went under the Detroit River for 1.6 miles or 2.6 kilometers. Very amazing civil engineering achievement to one, be able to tunnel this out at that time frame, and then two, be able to construct this in such an effective and efficient manner. I mean, really four years, and here's one of the construction pictures that we have of it. Make of it what you will, and by all means, let me know in the comments what you think of a picture like this, what's really going on here with this tunneling operation. Although we've got, again, multiple accounts about how this project unfolded and what were some of the challenges that they faced. Still, I think it's pretty impressive that they accomplished this in four years in the early 20th century. The early 20th century, of course, being a very ambiguous time in terms of what technological capabilities we had. And, of course, we have the picture of the supposed men in, in authority wearing their really cool hats as they're watching one of the boats moving into position to drop some of the tunneling apparatuses into place. It's an interesting photo, and this is the kind of story that they're going to tell us when they talk about how they constructed this tunnel and how they did it so efficiently within four years. Now, maybe they really achieved this, and maybe they really achieved this in the manner that's being depicted. However, I think we have to ask questions about how they were able to do it so effectively. The other interesting thing is this tunnel still operates today, and the ba basic infrastructure, the original infrastructure, still stands. There's been little to no improvement or renovation done on this tunnel, although there's been plenty on buildings, and yet this tunnel stands perfectly well today, only 110 years after its completion. Well, more like 113 years to be precise. Very interesting, and the fact being is that we always talk about our crumbling infrastructure in the United States, and we're always told about it, and yet here we have the very same Detroit River Tunnel that the trains go under, and there apparently seems to be no issue with it. It definitely communicates some things about the quality of construction, and we'll be told that they simply had more artisans and they worked harder in the early 20th century, and that's how they were able to build such a piece of infrastructure that endures so well to this day that they haven't had to invest a lot of time and money in renovations on. And fortunately, there hasn't been any sort of collapse or structural issue with this tunnel. I also find this picture very interesting because here we see a different kind of train going down the tunnel electric motor from eastbound tube under Detroit River with Michigan Central Train, Detroit, Michigan. So very interesting what we see with these kind of photos. And these are the kind of questions that we have to ask because at this point, how long has the tunnel been down there? How old is the tunnel and how old is the construction material within the tunnel? And now we go on to look at churches. Here we have the Cathedral Church of St. Paul, constructed in 1907, and we see the usual hallmarks of the amazing construction capabilities of the early 20th century. Beautiful towers, an incredible window, may possibly have had a cymatic purpose originally, in terms of when this building was originally constructed, unless we want to go with the historical account that it really was built in 1907 by the finest efforts of the good people of Detroit. And if they did pull this off, I do wonder why we don't build buildings like this now. It's a very beautiful building, and I find it very alluring. The construction time frame on it tends to vary a little bit, though. This is the Cathedral of the Most Blessed Sacrament, and we have a little bit of a different construction account on this one. They say this one, it took them from 1913 to 1930 to build, so a little bit more of a challenge, but definitely has some uh, echoes of some of the major cathedrals over in Europe, and of course, again, we see the main central window with the two amazing towers. Incredibly beautiful church, and... I wonder what kind of material they really used in terms of the walls and the foundation. And one of the things I constantly lament in many of these videos is that we have preciously few, as in none, photos of the construction of the foundation. This is the interior and just an incredibly beautiful church. I mean, it's a cathedral. I mean, but, you know, say it's a church, but a cathedral. And we see the same hallmarks of that construction style with the many arches and entryways and just the vast amount of interior space in a building like this. And of course we always suspect what's the original purpose of these incredible cathedrals that we see 
in all of these American cities, and how do they compare to the great cathedrals of Europe? Well, it's a subsequent exploration that we're going to be getting to on the channel, and I look forward to it, because believe it or not, the cathedrals in the New World compare quite favorably to the cathedrals in the so-called original Old World. This is St. Anne de Detroit. Okay, I know, it's a French name. Please excuse me. It was built in 1886 to 1887, and this is a very beautiful cathedral as well. Although, look at the towers and interesting design on that window, I have to say, as well. And did it serve the same purpose, or were there different purposes? Isn't it interesting how these churches and cathedrals, regardless of what they're classified as, always seem to have interesting similarities to their layout. I wonder if that really reflects the original function, or was that just because of the building principles at the time? And then here's the interior, and another gorgeous interior, again with the many archways and windows, and look at the floor with the design in that floor and the unique pattern on that. And I wonder if that's a granite floor, and this is definitely, well, all three of these churches are, or cathedrals or whatever we want to call them. I would love to visit all three of these structures just to get an idea of what their internal construction components are. It's always a lot more telling when you can go into a building and you can ascertain exactly what they used to build it, or at least get an idea for how solid it is. Or you could just watch a video and take the person presenting the video to you at their word, and you know, it may be true, especially if it's the media, right? And here we look at the City Hall of Detroit, and this is the 1870s City Hall. And this is what we'd expect for a 19th century city hall, isn't it? Very well built out, beautiful tower, little clock on it. Many aspects to the construction, along with the many different arches. And I like the way that the building seems to bring attention to it. And that's always something interesting about these old world buildings. And I do wonder about the true origin and function of this building, because, again, why do you need a building like this for a city hall? or a post office, or a federal office, or a district court, or whatever we tend to designate them as. And then here's the older city hall from the 1840s time frame. Yes, they considered this one a much more modest one. Really, you'd think that a city hall like this would still be suitable for the <laughs> functions of a city. Of course, they say they always need more space because as a city grows, so does the bureaucracy. And when the bureaucracy grows, you need more employees, right? In any event, very beautiful building, and while it may be smaller, it is certainly not a slouch by any comparison. I mean, look at the little cupola with the tower, and I like the tower on top of it, and we can already see well-developed buildings. Couldn't get an exact date on this photo, although supposedly this was from the 1890s. And now let's go to the Detroit Art Museum. This is a very intriguing building that existed from 1885 to 1960, or so we're told. And this was the original component of it that was built in 1885. And of course, you see, we have nothing short of a castle, or some people would call it a series of arches with some towers on it. I really enjoy the fact that it looks like that stone has been there for a very long time. And I've had some people tell me, well, it's simply the effect of rosification, which is an actual process in architecture. And yes, of course it is. There's always an explanation in architecture along with a fancy term for how you explain what kind of building style a building is. Now, this is apparently in the early 20th century where they've expanded the Detroit Art Museum. Well, you know, I guess you're going to need more room to display your art than just the little front of that building. It's interesting, though, if you compare this photo to the previous photo, and you wonder if somehow the previous photo was altered in some way. Not that I'm meaning to suggest that. Maybe this photo is altered. Because we don't know when we look at photos. We don't know what ground truth reality is. The only way to know would be to jump in the DeLorean, go back in that time frame, and see what the building really looked like in 1885. <laughs> Isn't that ironic that it is the year 1885 to any fans of that movie? I love the arches and the stairs going up to that, and I really enjoy the smaller subsidiary towers. And here's another picture of it. And you still have the tops on these towers, and it gives this building a very beautiful and fairy tale appearance. These are the kind of appearances that we would be delighted to see in our buildings, whether this is in a larger city like Detroit or a smaller town. I recall looking at a library that looked somewhat similar to this in La Crosse in Wisconsin, in the Mississippi River Valley, that had towers like this. But I suppose the reason it appeals to us so much is we can tell how a building like this really activates our imagination, our creative inspiration, and aspects that we may not fully understand about ourselves. When we see buildings like this, we question how they came to be and how they were constructed that time frame. 
And here a closer look at the stairs and some of the arches and again we see the scaling with the construction of columns. Something that seemed to be no difficulty for whoever or whenever this building was constructed. I also like the detail that you see in the windows and the arches on the windows in the tower. And then of course we have the usual base stones uh, going around the stairs. And I wonder where this came from. Was this limestone? Was this Indiana limestone that they hauled up there? Well, I mean, look at the blocks that are even above the archways in between the levels of this building. Just an incredible achievement. And of course, we'll be told, well, they had artisans, they had craftsmen, they had people who were willing to work, and there were no safety standards, and that's how they were able to build an amazing art museum like this. I mean, I certainly can't argue with why you'd want a building that would look like this to display art in. That part actually does make sense to me. I just wonder why is it that this building was something that was something that could be achieved in 1885. And I wonder if there's a contractor who would even give you a bid or any sort of design if you requested a building like this. Imagine if you took this picture, you had multiple schematics of it. I would like this building built and I would like it done within three years. I wonder what they'd tell you. Here's the court from it, the internal look, and look at the little tower and the windows and look at all the different colors in the brick. Just gorgeous. I mean, everything about this building does reflect art and there's no arguing with that point. Why is it we don't have our buildings reflect art? Well, it's because our buildings need to reflect functionality and cost because we have such limitations in cost now. That's what we'll be told. We don't act like we don't have an unlimited debt ceiling and that we can't just seem to throw infinite amounts of money at whatever world issues that we have, regardless of what nation we are. I mean, that's what we're told. Of course, they'll always warn us about the dangers of hyperinflation, but then they keep enacting the same policies. Here's a later picture of the Detroit Art Museum, and here you can see they've unfortunately ripped off the tops of the towers on each of the towers, the fairy tale aspect of it. Probably trying to make it look more like a quote unquote modern building. Yes, indeed. Why is it this always happens to these buildings? And this was clearly shortly before its uh, unfortunate demolishing in the period of urban renewal in the 1960s. I always found it ironic that urban renewal hit all the major American cities from the late 1950s to the early 1970s. And then in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a reputation of American cities that, <laughs> well, we'll just say they weren't the best. All right, now we're going to take a look at the schools of Detroit. This is Cooley High School, built in 1928, and it's been featured on many different explorations, and you've probably seen the interior of it, but looking at the exterior, we're told that it's some sort of Mediterranean revival style. <laughs> what else would it be? I'm surprised they don't call it Pirates of Darkwater revival style. Does anybody remember that show? It didn't last very long. Yeah, I'm dating myself there. Regardless, a very beautiful building, and look at the towers, and then you see some of the details in the doorway. Why do you need a high school to look like this? I, I mean, I'm not complaining. I'm just wondering why can't we give, you know, modern students a high school like this in the United States? Gorgeous high school in the city of Detroit with beautiful towers and nice big clock there in the middle. Because remember, we didn't have any kind of handheld pocket watches at that time in 1928. I mean, I guess it does go with the narrative that it was the Roaring Twenties, and this was before the Great Depression, and here we have a group of students coming out the doorway. But looking close at the doorway, look at the ornate detail in the columns with the twist around it, and then some of the detail above both the arched doorways, and again seeing the scaling with the columns there in the arched doorways. Thomas M. Cooley High School, very proud name. And look at the different coloring in the bricks, too. And then even the detail in the windows, as though they spared nothing with this building. In 1928... I mean, I wonder who was just wandering around there as a construction contractor who said, yes, we can do this. Here's one of the internal shots of uh, Cooley High School, and even the woodwork is very beautiful and reminds us of many of the state capitals that we've looked at in early explorations on this channel. I was just thinking, looking at that woodwork, and then even there you have columns, because we can't resist putting columns and pillars everywhere in these older buildings, it seems. Perhaps that was some sort of essential requirement. It couldn't be because they were part of a construction kit that were available in many different sizes, and we'll be doing a subsequent exploration where we actually examine columns. Here's the beautiful auditorium, and this is what it looked like uh, when the building was more in use. Just a gorgeous auditorium, although we'll look at a different angle here in a second. And remember, this is just an auditorium in a high school. Now again, I'm not degrading the importance of education or anything like that, 
but we're always told by our government throughout the ages how important education is. We could do something like this back in 1928. Why does it seem so difficult to do now? And please let me know in the comments. And here is one of the subsequent photos of the beautiful auditorium in the Cooley High School after it's deteriorated quite a bit. Yet even after the deterioration, you can still see the beauty and the detail in it. And you see it's kind of a tragedy that this building was just left to deteriorate like this. And yet at the same time, it does preserve a look at some of the detail within this auditorium. And the question has to be asked again, why would a high school require that kind of detail? And now we move on to our next school. This is Central High School. Why do they always have a Central High School in these towns? I'm reminded of Duluth. And this was built from 1893 to 1896. Quite a beautiful high school. And again, you see the similar trappings with the incredible tower and the beautiful towers and subsidiary towers. Because one tower is not enough. You need more than that. Because how else are they going to know that it's a high school? Again, why can't we get high schools like this today? This building is still with us today, and it's very beautiful, and it's now part of uh, Wayne State University in Detroit, and they call it Old Main. And why do they always call these older buildings Old Main, I wonder? I'm reminded of Old Main, the soldier's home near Milwaukee, and it has many similar building aspects to it with the big, huge clock tower and the other pointy towers, and then even seeing the large stone construction towards the base. And, of course, you have the large arched doorways. Otherwise, how are you going to know where the doorway is if you don't have a large arch around it? This is an interior photo, and we see the similar hallmarks with the beautiful columns. Looks like it's made out of marble. I wonder what the floor is made out of, if it's solid granite as well, because, again, I'm given reminders of what many of the beautiful state capitol buildings that we've explored look like when you look at the interior of this building. That's an academic building and was originally constructed as a high school. In three years, 1893 to 1896, because boy, could we build them back then. I don't know what it was with that time frame in the 1890s. I mean, look at this, with this stairway and the arch over it and the detail everywhere. As though they just had so much time on their hands that they were happy to do this kind of detail, to have a school ready to go and do it in three years, easily, so students could attend and be inspired every time they walk up those stairs. Mm, causes me to reconsider some of the schools I went to growing up, and I'm beginning to wonder which ones were old world buildings, and maybe we'll have to take a look at some of them for future explorations, if they're interesting enough. I mean, look at this here. Again, you see this detail above this doorway. Why would you put the wreath in there? What's that all about? And what's that really signifying if this is indeed from an older civilization? I do wonder. And again, I'm wondering exactly what the floor is made out of, and you see that the pillars in the wall look like they're made out of some very solid material, whether it's granite, limestone, or sandstone, or whatever other type of stone that we'll be told that was hauled in from some vast distance and was part of the easy construction. Even a classroom has a bit of a detail to it when you look at the ceiling, and it just doesn't seem like this was a building that was originally supposed to be a high school, and yet we're told that it was built from the ground up to be a high school. Well, I'm not sure what to think of this one. What, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. It's just another question of why is it that we had older buildings that were this beautiful, this ornate, and this detailed in Detroit, and now we don't have this currently. And now we've reached Michigan Central Station. And this is the original one, of course, from the 1860s, because if you're going to have a central station, you're going to have multiple incarnations of it. And even the original one from the 19th century looks very beautiful with the large clock tower. And, you know, maybe if it was from the mid-19th century, I could buy the fact as to why they need clock towers, because at that time, Waltham wasn't up with producing enough pocket watches. But then after the United States Civil War... Anyways, uh, apparently the old central station was falling apart and suddenly burned down. Surprise, surprise. So in a year, 1913 and 1914, they built this beauty. And this is one of the original postcards, apparently right from 1914, as construction was completed and it was opened. Yes, this was a rush job in the early 20th century. Again, our building methods and our ability to rapidly plan, design, and construct these buildings is just incredible. But don't worry, someone will tell you that uh, these buildings could be done today very easily. Well, here's what it looks like more recently. It has fallen into disrepair, and yet we can still see a lot of the styling details on the original train station with the large columns and three pediments there, not just one or two. And just look how unbelievably tall this building is. 
And we looked at this initially when we did our map exploration. And apparently this is being uh, revived and renovated by the Ford company currently, and it's supposed to be reopened this year. So at least this is one old world building that has survived and is being renovated. This is a photo of from the 1950s when it was still in use, and you can see that it already looks incredibly old, although it's only about 40 years old in this picture. Well, make of it what you will and intriguing that we see the detail on it and yet this building looks like it's a lot older than 40 years i don't know maybe i'm just imagining things or you know you get those rough winters in detroit and maybe the buildings get stained and here's another photo of it from the 1980s looks like you got a nissan pulsar there is that a mazda oh, okay sorry i get distracted sometimes and you can see how the building well, more or less looks like it's holding up well structurally i know that 30 years later yet we see the same discoloration on it as though it just appears as though it's very very old although again only about 70 years if this is the mid to late 1980s which it looks like this photo is correct if we go off of the model of cars here's an internal photograph of the train station again just beautiful with the massive columns the beautiful arches and this is another building that clues to different uses and different functions why do you need windows that large anyway? Are you really looking out of them at any point in time? And if you're just a passenger in a train station, you're only concerned about getting to your next train. No, I need to walk under these very amazing and beautiful ceilings with these cool designs in them so I can get distracted and miss my train. Look at this hallway. Just incredible. An elaborate amount of detail for a train station. And really, I think it's unfortunate that they ever allowed this building to fall into disrepair. And of course, we'll be given the usual reasons that number of passengers and income was declining. And of course, we couldn't find support from the government because money only comes from the government when it's convenient and you know, not when we need it to save a building. Just look at the, the way that it's carved in with some of the aspects on the ceiling. And here you see some of the columns and someone going to get their tickets with a nice large clock above it because you know you need to have a ceiling that's at least 30 feet high although it's better if it's 50 to 100 feet high those are the best train stations and they run most efficiently and if you have huge columns in them that's going to make them run even more efficiently just look at any of the union stations that we've looked at in previous explorations going all the way back to our very early exploration of union station in kansas city and now we go to detroit's incredible buildings this is the Guardian Building, built 1927 to 1928. That's right, one year to erect this incredible building, that Art Deco period. And isn't it interesting how it's both a skyscraper that has beauty and artistic design put into it? And of course, we'll just be told, well, that was the stylings of Art Deco. We don't do that now because fiscally, that's not responsible. And why would we want to build a beautiful building these days when you can build nice square looking glass and steel towers that reach up into the sky? Gorgeous building and even the roof of it looks like it has a lot of beautiful detail with it. Here's our construction photo and again make of it what you will. I find the little building to the right of it very interesting as well. It kind of reminds me almost of the Mitchell building in Milwaukee. And what do you think of this construction photo? I'm not going to offer my opinion on it because I think you can guess just by looking at the sky on this one and it doesn't look like they tried very hard. Here's an interior photo of the Guardian building and look at the design and detail within this with the different colorations and the patterns. And this really gives you the impression of a building that's from another time and another place. A skyscraper that was part of a different civilization. Of course, we'll be reassured that it's from the Art Deco time. Right. Look at this entryway here with a desk and the way each of the halls has a triangular pattern with details in each of the triangular patterns. And then it goes all the way down the hall and what looks to be to a series of elevators. This is definitely a building I want to go visit in person because this is a beautiful building. And even as Art Decos go, this is incredibly beautiful. I mean, one year to achieve all of this detail and all this design. I mean. At least the, it was the Roaring Twenties, and we haven't fallen in the Great Depression yet. Although the interesting thing about the Great Depression is how we know that the United States government seemed to have no limitations on its funds. And then, of course, when we had the Gold Act, that helped its funds. Look at that beautiful depiction of Michigan back there as a state. What is really being depicted here, I wonder? Is this just an artistic impression, a beautiful design that inspires us? And it most certainly does. 
or is this representing something else? You know, when you look at things like this, you can almost imagine this building inspiring some sort of science fiction movie. I mean, they could have very easily filmed Blade Runner here. Look at these exterior details. What's this really depicting? It's another Native American. Of course, that's what we'll be told. But is it? And look at that. The ornate beauty in both the structure and the coloration. Really, this building defies words to describe, both internally and externally. And while it's beautiful externally, it really has its story told on the internal aspects of it. All this in a year? And they could achieve this? And what's the story? Well, we just had all these craftsmen and all these hard workers that were willing to be there. Very interesting depiction of Michigan now looking at that wall mural closer. And just a tremendous mural. And I wonder how large this one is. And this is something certainly I'd love to see in person. Yes, it looks like we have some modern paintings towards the ground. Well, let's move on to the Fisher Building. The Fisher Building, another one-year wonder or 15-month wonder that just happened to be completed in 1928 because I guess the Guardian Building wasn't enough Art Deco for Detroit. And this is the postcard of it, and as you can see, it actually looks like it takes up an entire city block for this building. And here's a more modern picture of it, and here you can see that there's some more beautiful exterior styling on this Art Deco building from 1928. And just remember that, 15 months. That's what they tell us. It took them 15 months. Again, it was the Roaring Twenties, and oh, by the way, they were also building the Guardian building at the same time. Well, it was Detroit, and I guess they figured, why not put up two beautiful Art Deco buildings that people would remember for all time, if we want to go with the historical account. This one has even more exterior beauty, though, I think, than the Guardian, just a little bit. But that's just my opinion. I mean, they're both gorgeous buildings. And certainly, they exceed anything that we build today. Look at this interior with this kind of design and detail. And look at the floor to the walls to the ceiling. And just the amount of time and effort that went into this. 15 months? 15 months. Why don't you just call this uh, Wonder Building architectural style? The fact that they even expect us to stomach that. I mean, look at this. This isn't just a building that's tall. This is a building that covers a lot of area as well. With a dome and beautiful lights hanging down from it. And again, concentric archways. And uh, look at the floor again. This is a very large building. And I'm just, again, speechless when I look at the interior of this. This is in Detroit. True, unbelievable beauty that was achieved in the 1920s or so, we're told. And if we really could achieve this in the 1920s, regardless of how it was possible, this is where we really have to ask some hard questions. We just opt not to build like this anymore? Because we're all about cost-effectiveness here in the mighty 21st century? Is that really our best answer? But here, I've got a trillion dollars to develop an F-35 fighter, but we, we just don't put it in buildings anymore. You know, we're going to need that fighter. By the way, have you heard about that fighter being used in a current regional conflict? Neither have I. Look at this. Just incredible beauty with the reflection and the lights. And again, this is something that's otherworldly. This is something that's fantastical beyond the ability of words to describe. And you could see any science fiction or fantasy movie being filmed in a building like this. Well, now we save the best for last. The Detroit Masonic Building, as you can see by the postcard, built from 1920 to 1926. This is the largest Masonic building in the world, with over 1,000 rooms inside of it. We looked at the incredible Masonic Building in Indianapolis, and we thought there was nothing that could compare to that. And yet we find the largest Masonic Temple in Detroit, Michigan. And the postcard doesn't do it justice, but you have to ease your way into this one. Look at the gorgeous beauty and the magnitude of this building. And they did this in six years? Now we're just looking at the exterior, and yet we see something that's a castle, a palace, a capital of perhaps some vast region. One wonders what the original purpose was. Now yes, I played a little game where I inserted this picture in earlier, but just to show you that can you really tell the difference between this and the Art Deco style? Or does this indicate that there's a style that some previous civilization used on the Fisher, the Guardian, and this Masonic Temple buildings? That's what I really wonder. And I'd like you to let me know what you think in the comments. 
Because what does this really represent? What is this really all about? I mean, I know we're told that this is a Masonic temple, and yes, this is the actual picture of a Masonic temple, being honest with you this time. But sometimes I think it's important to ask questions and not take everything we're told at face value. This is very much a building I would love to see in person. Isn't this an interesting uh, doorway and very, very interesting motif there? What do we have? The giant cat or panther of doom from the Garfield cartoon? And it looks like we've got an eagle or a phoenix, depending on your interpretation. Whatever other details in this unbelievable building. We're only looking at the outside of it right now. Just wait until we get to the interior. I'm still trying to fathom how exactly they achieved this unbelievable achievement within six years. 1920 to 1926. Just in the years after World War I, and also after the outbreak of a nasty influenza that was a worldwide pandemic. Right after that, in fact, that was still going on when they started constructing this building. I mean, I guess they give us a little bit more credit by telling us it actually took them six years. But just looking at the exterior detail with all the windows going on and the vast towers and the way the towers meet at the top, there's a reason why I question if this building had some greater function. Here's our construction photo, and again you see issues with scaling, you see the vanilla skies and the usual challenges that we have. Why, why exactly does it appear as though there's always such signs of symmetry when they construct these things? Is that really how they did it? And I'm seriously asking. There's just something that seems a little off about some of these photos. You know, namely, it's always the absence of workers, and oh, look at the power lines running right up there to the side of the building. Well, I guess they weren't concerned about that. What is really going on here? 1923, so in only three more years, they'd have this building finished. And here's another uh, exterior detail. And again, the scene, beautiful figures that are carved up above the doorway or assembled above the doorway. I mean, who knows exactly how this was done. We'll be told that it was assembled in pieces. Well, if it looks like it was assembled in pieces in the photographs, I wonder if it was. But... I'll again elicit, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting figure, I'll elicit your responses in the feedback to see what you think. A little interesting coloration too on that rather uh, ghastly looking court gesture sort of figure and whatever meaning that has. And again, I'm, I'm just taking this all at face value. I'm not looking into the meanings behind any of this because I think that's how we have to approach these explorations. And here, more ornate detail. Very intriguing figures, and I have seen this on many other buildings and figures like this on other buildings, not just on Masonic temples or the largest Masonic temple in the world. Or do we want to call it the largest royal palace or royal capital in the world? Yes, look at this stage here, and look at the beautiful ornate detail in the ceiling. And I believe this is the venue that you can fit a thousand people in. Looks like you can fit a thousand people in there. So you can put on your greatest indoor concerts. Or perhaps you could do your coronation ceremony if you're Ming the Merciless and want to have yourself declared Emperor of the Universe. Anybody knows what series that's from, let me know. Ah, yes, yeah, so we have to put the year in it. Apparently that's the cornerstone, 1922. Look at this. Wow. Just an incredible room that gives the same trappings that we've seen in many cathedrals with the archways and the detail. And look at the floor. There is no beauty and no expense spared in the interior of this building. And this is really something that defies simple explanation. And here it looks like we've got a ballroom. So, you know, after Ming the Merciless has himself declared ruler of the universe, then he can go marry his Empress of the Hour, Dale Arden, and enjoy it. And hopefully Flash doesn't show up to disrupt the ceremony. Yeah, I'm talking about the 1980 movie, if anybody's wondering. Maybe I'm losing my mind because I'm just looking at too many of these buildings, but there is just something about this Masonic temple that is truly mind-blowing. Look at the detail in the ceiling. Just this kind of venue. I mean, this is something you could film any movie in, and this would be a very convincing set for anything from some large parliamentarian proceedings or large meeting or august body, and it would look so convincing. Okay, got to move on from this one. All right, I have to have a little fun to close this one off. This is Canadian-American actor Matthew Perry. He's famous as Chandler from the Friends franchise. And then on the right there, we have Matthew C. Perry, the naval officer. Do you think that Matt Perry could portray his namesake? 
I think he could if he just grew his hair out a little bit. And maybe if he went on a drunken bender or two. Or he just acted like Chandler did. Was Chandler the nice guy? I don't know. I never really watched Friends. Don't hold it against me. Consider joining the channel as a member. You can be an explorer and receive early access to content, or you can be a prime explorer and have exclusive content that you can't watch on the regular channel. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for joining me today.